Let me show these suckers how to ball out here. Oh, man. Let me get this together here. Oh, layup. Oh, shot. Oh, three. Three. Oh, it's like Brick City out here. Mid-range. Oh, my goodness. I can't buy a bucket out here. I missed the whole damn basket. Oh, my goodness. What's going on, man? My game is looking trash. Rap. Oh, here we go. Black Power Media shirt. Now we cooking. Now we cooking. Tree. Tree. I'm taking all three of y'all with these right here. Between the legs. Oh, my goodness. Behind the back. Layup. Oh, and then he just do a reverse. He is in beast mode out here. I ain't got to look. It's falling. Oh, my goodness. This guy is going. Three, two, one. Kobe. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. Nice. Empower yourself. Go get me some of that Black Power Media again. Right here, Black Power Media Top 4. Yep. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here on Black Power Media. Jared Ball, Daniel Taluk, one half of the soccer crew is here. What's up, Daniel? I don't know where everybody up, is. This is. Am I am I coming in good, loud, clear, all that? Loud, clear, all of that. Uh, good, good, and, good. And, and I hope I am as well. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, fresh back from traveling the world are we talking about any of that today is any of that relevant i don't want to be if you, you know, got your questions business out there uh, i mean i do i always want to hear about, about travel you went yeah. you just came back from uganda uganda yeah uh always interested in hearing about what's going on on the continent and 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 uh but yeah i just wasn't sure if that was going to be on the agenda uh so i didn't, I didn't do much yes. football stuff if i'm honest no so no it was it was a family it was a family affair so my father's okay, right from, from uganda and um, it's my first time in Africa, first time seeing my family. So it was a, it was a, an important, oh, wow. like, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's not a vacation. Like people have been like, how was your vacation? All of this. It's like, it's not a vacation. It was like a uh, pilgrimage is a bit too spiritual for me, but mm. along those lines. So, no, yeah. I get it. Even as a, you know, kind of a, 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 a secularist myself, I mean, particularly that first trip to the continent still for me resonates where, 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 where have you been or where did you uh, go? on the continent uh the first place i went to was uh tanzania in 96 well well technically that's actually well technically that's not true technically i had been to egypt once in the navy but i tend not to count a lot of those travels that was a lot of debauchery and youthful ignorance and <laughs> underappreciation uh so but but so Tanzania, uh, I did go to Kenya, uh, Zanzibar. I did. I have also been to uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, then I went back to Egypt for a more real trip, uh, and into to the southern part of the country to to see more of the the, the African origins and history there as well. Uh, and I don't think I'm missing anything. But thought that's where I, that's that's where I've been mm. on the continent so far. Yeah. So. so like, um, how would I put this? I told myself like I would only start traveling once I've been home first. So mm. so now that I've got that home part off the list, I can now broaden and I, I won't feel guilty spending money. Like Robert was like, "Come to Brazil." I'm like, "I'm not going to Brazil before I've been to yeah. home and, and see my place." So I, 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 I think that's the moral way to go about it, at least for me. The only I like country that. I, I'm not mad yeah, at that. Yeah, the, the only country I won't go to on the continent is South Africa, but you know, that's you won't <laughs> go. Won't no 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 no. But this is this is the moral objection. <laughs> to, so we just to, had to, to how that place is set up. So shout out to Piper Carter and her recent discussion with Tony Blackman, uh, who as an ambassador of hip hop for the UN went to South Africa and uh, I've had my own issues with that, but, but they had an interesting discussion of that. And Tony's response to that was what, what we had even covered on this show uh, in terms of the 50th anniversary of the hip hop and I, and Tony Blackman, I don't know if you're what she's, a, she's a, sort of a legend in, in as a, as a uh, hip hop performer 
and as an ambassador uh, for hip hop and uh, for people in the DC area in particular, the Freestyle Union. She's a she's a legendary MC and very talented, uh, brilliant woman. Uh, I think we probably disagree on this particular issue, but her argument was to oversimplify, maybe not, was who would you rather have representing black people in South Africa? If not me, who? In other words, they're going to send somebody. And so that's like my, selling drugs. Like so, some somebody's going to buy the drugs. So it might as well be me. Like, so that was, I mean, that's one way. <laughs> my reaction was it would have to be someone else. I can't imagine doing it for that. Yeah that that purpose uh uh but but i don't know also that i would sort of embargo myself from going to south africa either um maybe not under those auspices but that's 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 but hey you know right on right on right on <laughs> I mean, no i mean i'm not mad at it you know there's there's 53 other ones so I'm sure good. there's plenty of other continent to see <laughs> yeah. this that's that's no so, doubt no doubt but no um, like i would i would i would like to go to brazil so like when when, when robert gets here we can yeah we if can... robert would show up uh <laughs> he said he's he said he's reading the the Zyron interview that i sent i was like i didn't mean i'm like i didn't mean for you to be late to the show to read the interview <laughs> i just i i put the video on times two and i just I watched it that way so yeah. Okay, so I didn't I didn't watch the video because of my own talk about it personal embargo. It was my personal embargo with the Real News Network, which you're I not think giving is, them no views, no views. <laughs> well, they've done me, you know. So if you remember, I don't want to, you know, since we got a minute, I'll just share this much. But if you remember when Zyron came through and said he would have me on his show with the Real News, I told you all I didn't think that was going to happen, and not because of Dave, mm. who who just lost his his mother, rest in peace, oh, and and sorry. you know you know. And Robert let us know in the chat and, and I, you know, sent condolences to Zyron. And so this is not personal. I actually, you know, I actually have uh, to the detriment of some other of my associations, uh, actually like Dave uh, uh, and we go back some time. But but uh, uh, I told I said he wasn't going to I said it wasn't going to happen because the the and this is true, uh, the, the singular at the time that I was aware uh, probably still is the case, uh, most important funder and founder of that organization, and this very wealthy white dude out West had has, uh, from what I understand, he put the embargo on me coming to, to the real news. So, uh, so I'm like, well, you know, if it's going to be like that, and if we're going to disrespect my, my contribution to that channel at one point, then, then, you know, then so be it. But, but uh, uh, nonetheless, I did read the transcript, uh, which is, you know, they got to click on their website, if not a view on the YouTube. So, but, uh, but it's unfortunate for me because I like the discussion. So reading it was, was cool. I'm sure it was, it was cool to watch. Um, but uh, so, so we'll wait for Robert and, and, uh and I thought everybody was going to be here. I thought this was Mutanda's preferred time on, in, uh, to be specific. So I was like, what? Or did you say? I can't remember. But anyway, hopefully I, they'll I, be I, here. I, I never said times. Dates, sure. But Dates. like okay. time in the day? Like, uh, that's up to other people. So uh, Erica's asking, what's up, Erica? Uh, what's the difference between ambassadors for hip hop and the role that artists of the Harlem Renaissance being sent around the world on behalf of the CIA State Department? Uh, what is the difference? I'm unaware of there being a difference. The the and again, I always pointed to the explicit statement made by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in 2015, where she said to that point of that question, she she said, "We're going to use hip hop artists internationally exactly as we previously used jazz artists." So, and we know the history. And again, uh, uh, we covered it here. Re not, I, I can't remember when, but but the the uh, um, what was that show on NPR? Did a really good 50th anniversary hip hop uh, um, segment where they got into that history and brought it to Tony's attention. And in uh, now I can't remember anybody's name, but the brother who I actually presented with at one point, he was in the piece, but he said he he was explaining sort of what we're saying. He was like, I I, I couldn't do that. And then they they edited an interview with Tony 
and was basically raising that same issue with her. And her explanation was sort of what I just already said. So I can I can I ask a question to like a professor, I suppose. Like the 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 the, the famous image of Louis Armstrong blowing his horn with, with the pyramid, was that done by FBI, CIA, State Department? Exactly. And yeah. so and that is exactly the story that that NPR piece got into and I thought did a very good job of. And it was actually timed specifically, I think, either a day before or after the assassination of Patrice Lumumba. Oh, so wow. there was an explicit attempt to use Armstrong as cover for their involvement in getting rid of Lumumba. And it's something similar that I thought, actually it's wild, I was I remember listening, I actually heard the lecture as I was in Cairo. And Kwame Ture, this was an old lecture obviously, but it, uh, um, uh, he had talked about how the, the, the Cairo Tower, which I was actually having lunch looking at while I was hearing, listening on the, on the, the in the headphones. This, he said the Cairo Tower was funded by the money that went to Nasser from the State Department to assassinate Ture. And Nasser at the time said, no, I'm going to take the money. And instead of killing our comrade, I'm going to build the Cairo build Tower. The so I'm like, <laughs> and so it's, I, I think the, the and I, it's not a direct parallel, but it's just something that popped into my head. So, but, but yes, the attempt was to use Armstrong. And apparently he knew it and was more aware of it, uh, and I don't remember enough of the details uh, to to, but but you know, so there was a lot going on behind that smile. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I think there is, and this is uh, again, I just uh, why I've just, and, and not just with Tony. I mean, I've had a number of uh, when you know conversations with artists over the years who I've known who have done similar. Uh, State Department sponsored tours and have raised that question. And again, it doesn't always end well for me socially or personally. Like I don't, mm. it, it's not, it's not, it doesn't ingratiate you to communities to raise that question. The only rapper I know that like from my own research, I think is Asher Roo because he's the one that did the the, the Boondocks theme. If I if I have it correct, he did, and, 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 and I'm a fan of the Boondocks. So, like when I did the research, I was like, "Oh, he did, and he went to Africa." Blah, blah. So, so Asheru oh, shout out is <laughs> shout out to Asheru. That's my man, one of my favorite MCs. He's been on this platform. He's been, I've been. I know he's from know, DC area, so I was from like, the maybe there's some overlap. He's, he's from DC. Uh, I think he's originally, I think by birth or something like from Virginia maybe but he's lives in and sort of a he's he's DC and uh uh really a brilliant MC and one of my favorites in fact but he did it uh uh I think my man Head Rock was considering it at one point or may have uh I remember Opus Akabin Akabin another DC uh legendary hip hop group uh I mean these are like brilliant MCs like people that whose music I've really appreciated i just disagreed with that engagement and uh so i tend and i prefer to do it this way uh, admittedly but i my what i tend to lean back on is to say that those of us who want different outcomes we need to organize other opportunities for for folks uh, uh for artists and others who are who are maybe not as connected to a certain politic or organization as some of the rest of us but but I, what can I say? Uh, I, you know, what can I say? We just don't agree on that. The value of that. In fact, I think it doesn't help. Uh, so I would, uh, and I'm going to look up my man's name in a minute, but, but uh, who was, who was juxtaposed in this interview I'm thinking of to, to, with Tony Blackman, who was just saying, look, I just would have to find another way if I were asked. Like I'm not, I think he was invited and turned it down. I think he turned it down. Uh I just think it's easier if you just present yourself initially as someone who would not be a value to that to never and then never get asked and it just makes it easier. That's been my that's the route I've preferred. Just just present yourself as having no value to that project. And we shoot bail by like it's just a free flight to Africa like you know like, it's just a paid business class well, for like I mean I know part of the argument the, has been, yeah. you know, you know, we can make value out of it, even if that's not their intent. And I think there is uh, a little bit of that sentiment involved. 
And and I, I again, I don't agree. I just think the optics of it don't balance. So, yeah. uh, uh, but Robert, hey, we're busy. Char- Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, gentlemen. What's up? What's up? What's up? I was I, anxiously. I like that jersey you got back there. Hey, I'm trying to, you know, keep keep the theme keep yeah. the theme together, and nice. uh, uh, and some of the stuff you sent. And and including even what we were just talking a little bit about in prefacing the Zyron interview that we were uh, maybe going to add to the discussion. Uh, it is I just A D Carson. Thank you, Elon. Thank you. A D Carson is the professor at UVA who I'm talking about was juxtaposed to Tony Blackman, uh, who in his hip hop performance and work was like I'm not, you know. And I did have the pleasure of meeting the brother and, and presenting with him uh, a year or so ago out in California, uh, which was cool. And people could check the channel if they want to see that. Uh, but but uh, so I, I'm more that's the lane I'm more involved in. But yeah. But yeah, but there was but yeah, Robert, yeah, to the point of the jersey, there's, you know, this this backlash globally continues. And there were some things that that I was not aware of that have been happening uh, with players losing contracts for supporting Palestine. I thought one oh, of the, yeah. the other points yeah. that was raised in this this interview, and I can pull it up here in a second if we want to, unless we want to start somewhere else. Uh, no, that's, where, I think that's a great place to start. All right, well, uh, so yeah, and and again, shout out to Dave uh, and his family recovering from that the, the loss to, to, to their loved one and uh, uh, wish them all you know the best. Uh, but this interview from December 21st, uh, albeit, you know, despite it being, you know, at the yeah. Real News Network, even soccer is a target in Israel's war on Palestine. And uh, I'm happy to go with wherever you want in this discussion. But but uh, Abdullah al Arian is the interviewee. And there were a couple points that I just wanted to to that I was thinking of just now in terms of why I've got this jersey up or one of the reasons to have the jersey up is that uh, in being in, in being asked in response to a question about what is going on with Palestinian support in the soccer world, uh, al Arian says this, and so in, in the case, for instance, of the Scottish club Celtic, whose fans have a very long and deep history of being very much on the side of colonized people. This kind of goes into the tradition of Irish republicanism that Celtic represents, very much part of the working class, very much kind of in favor of migrant rights and so forth. And so part of that rich history and tradition has seen it express its solidarity or seen the fans express that solidarity with Palestine going back many, many years. And yet now, of course, they're being threatened, not just by the board of the club, so the corporate board that makes up the leadership of the club has threatened fans with expulsion. And at the same time, we've seen UEFA, uh, which governs the European competition, find the fans $19,000 just for showing up with Palestinian flags at a recent match. Uh, So I appreciated this point about, this actually speaks to what we were just saying about uh, having one's art be used in support of the state that images travel widely. So that's sort of my mm-hmm. argument, why I think it doesn't matter what you do behind the scenes. It's those public images of your support that that travel widely. And in this case, what al Arian is saying, that Palestinians receive these messages and recognize them even in the midst of this ongoing uptick of the genocide. Uh, they are in some ways being made aware of the support globally. And I guess on some level it's being seen as, as uh, helping. Uh, but just a couple other things that I'll stop here, but, but uh, I didn't realize that the entire city of Barcelona voted to cut ties with Israel, uh, which, which I thought was pretty cool. And then this case here of Anwar El Ghazi, a Dutch Moroccan player who showed support for Palestine on his social media, got suspended by his german club mines if i have mines yep that's it and then the last point i wanted to raise and then i'll turn it over to the both of you was this one here that i I thought this point was interesting that for all of the 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 concern in the european world about saudi arabian involvement in buying up clubs or or not buying up clubs but in starting their own league and buying players at exorbitant fees and bringing even some superstars albeit at the end of their career to to their league uh while they're complaining about 
we're, you know, the Europeans are saying, oh, we're losing our best players at the end of their career and they're ending up in obscurity. And what are these Saudi, they, the Saudis don't have a tradition? Da, 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 da. What I liked about what Al Arian is saying here is that people like Kareem Benzema, the, the Algerian descended French national player, who at the end of his career took a big contract to go to Saudi Arabia, has felt the political freedom in Saudi Arabia that he hadn't in, in, in the 15 or 16 years he had playing in Europe, where he's been more expressive in his support for Palestine. So I thought, that's dope. In addition to whatever pettiness I feel about some some European billionaires getting upset and feeling threatened at, at, at others buying into their sport, their quote unquote sport, I like that apparently this is giving some room for uh, players to to express themselves more fully, being now in Saudi Arabia and obviously not fully under the yoke of a, of a Zionist uh, uh, influence in that way. So mm. those are just a couple highlights for me, and then I'll, I'll stop there and take it over, take it away. Yeah, I think the paragraph underneath the Benzema one is also instructive as well, where he talked about how the support for Ukraine in the European oh, kind yeah. of arena was almost expected. He even called it, you know, standard official position of, you know, the footballing bodies. Right. But what, but when it comes to the Israeli uh, just terrorism, really of, of Palestine, it's nobody can say anything. And if you do say anything, then you're punished. So I think those connect in, in, in a way. No, right on, right on. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, we, we're, we're constantly being told when we even used to see some of the memes, you know, usually where, where folks are saying, I, you know, leave, uh, stop the politics, just give us the football. Like, we don't want politics, yeah. just just the game. Yeah. Like, there's no politics. But as soon as anybody expresses a counter politic or an unsanctioned politic, here come the, po the, 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 the actual politics become more clear. <clears throat> clear. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting because I, you know, that just what you said, Jared, makes me go back to uh, to to Dave Zirin's documentary on the NFL. You know, mm -hmm. um, as if as if sports do not, you know, have political messaging. I mean, it, sports is all about political messaging. You know, part particularly in the United States. I mean, the message that the NFL passes out is is just so blatant. Mm -hmm. It's not even not even funny. I guess I was I'm kind of disappointed, although not surprised by by the NBA's response, you know, and, and by Abdullah's reference to it as well in the article where he talks about the fact that they didn't really they didn't really come out, you know, and say anything. Oh, right. the, yeah. the only person that has really, you know, somewhat said something symbolically was Kyrie. Um, <laughs> and he's been to me. Yeah, his his he he has no. But but I, but slightly differently than that. It's not that the NBA <clears throat> players have not said anything. They've come out in defense of Israel. They've been. Well, see, I, I haven't. I haven't seen that. I yeah. Down here, I haven't seen that. Uh, uh, the, what, the what most. You see the, up there? there was well the 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 now retired Amari, Amari Stoudemire who had converted to Judaism has oh, been well, very. Okay. I mean, he was he was I mean, he was. Uh, 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 Oh, ten no, toes down right. for the Zionist project. Ten <laughs> toes. <laughs> he was and 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 hands and fingers. He was all all his digits were on the ground for 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 Israel and 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 specifically targeting Black Lives Matter and Black people, saying, "How dare you? After all the Jews have done for for you and us, <laughs> that you wouldn't come out Jesus in defense." I, I mean, it was crazy. I haven't seen that. Uh, I'm glad I didn't uh, see that. But I thought um, now I just went blank on what, what else I but but I'm, I'm uh, yeah yeah the Floyd May Mayweather one I know that's not NBA but his was his egregious as well. What, 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 did, what did Floyd what did Mayweather? He, I can imagine he, he went on he went marching at one point. He was like seen at some some pro Israel march. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's 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 all about the greenbacks. I mean that's uh, that's the only point of reference. Oh, this is. And Adam Silver praised Henry Kissinger. Oh wow, I missed Jesus that one. Jesus Christ! Yeah, that's unbelievable. Uh, uh, by the way, somebody asked. I mentioned that my mother had um, hated Kissinger all, and and I went to see her the other day. And unfortunately, the Alzheimer's took away the 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 the, oh, the fury. My mother, yes, yeah, yeah, but she didn't remember. I said, I said, do you remember Kissinger? And she said, no. And I said, she said, why? I said, he just died. And she just said, oh, I don't. And, and the mother I knew would have been 
toasting. She'd have raised a glass. <laughs> Said, good riddance, you yeah. mother. <laughs> it would have been a whole bunch of curse words. And, you know, and, spe- and, speaking, but, speaking, yeah. speaking of, um, of forms of amnesia, uh, two, two points. One is that, and I've, I've been working on this thesis for a while. I haven't published anything about it, but I've been working on this thought process for a while and taking notes and what have you. But there's one thing about, you know, the conservative mind that strikes me as consistent. Mm-hmm. And that is that the, the conservative mind cannot maintain their positions politically or sociologically or economically without erasing history. I mean, erasing history is the key element of the stature that they maintain publicly. Um, And that goes for, you know, that's a global blanket statement I'm making. I think they are, they, they have to erase history because anybody that looks at the full history of what has happened over the past 75 or 80 years is... You, you can't come out any other kind of way if you're a human being. You know, you cannot come out any other kind of way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by the, you know, by the scope of the consistency of the right wing. It's just unbelievable. And the United States, I mean, yeah, it's no surprise, obviously. The, the four professional sports leagues are, are obviously billionaires boy, billionaire boys clubs. But um, and I so do have another question for you. I've been back to reading your book. Uh, oh, speaking good. of those, and and uh, um, I don't. One of my problems is I rarely read things in order. But I did just read the just this morning uh, the postscript. So when you mentioned this this point about the dominance of the leagues, there's a couple questions I want to. I, I got a number of questions for you, but I, mm-hmm. before we shift fully to that, I just want to make sure everybody's good on on the Zyron piece, or if there's more you wanted to say. Um, and then I also specifically wanted to ask if there was an update on what the MLS has been, because I know you wanted to raise the question about the, the only update I have on MLS. Yeah. I mean, this, the season, as you know, is over now. But the only, right. uh, and the, the, actually, just as an aside. Um, the, the team that won this year, not that anybody cares, but the team that won this year was the Columbus Crew. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, the Columbus Crew is the only team in MLS that has a black coach. From oh, France. Damn. I forget. I didn't even know. I, 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 I can't remember what his name is. But, you know, he's a, you know, he's a well-respected coach. I mean, he's, you know, now that he's won, of course, he's in a, you know, kind of a different dimension, you know. Um, but I just, I just wanted to put that out there as a, as a statement because, you know, the black coaches in any sport is something to pay attention to. Um, there are obviously yeah, that no, is, no black owners in MLS, but that's another story. I, unless you want to say, I think KD owns a piece. Magic Johnson too. doesn't own like 0.00%. Yeah. Now we're not talking yeah. about, yeah, we're not talking about collective. <laughs> KD, KD, KD owns a piece of Philadelphia. KD owns a piece of the Philadelphia. Thing. Yeah, there was a Magic Johnson owns an NFL team. You look at it, it's like point zero zero four percent. Yeah, of, exactly. Or watching yeah. the football team, it's yeah. like ah, yeah. It's, you know, he, it's, he's making no the old, decisions. They used him to go to the go go. They had yeah, him at the yeah, go go. Yeah. They had Magic yeah. Johnson shaking his butt at a go go, and they were like, yeah, "Yeah, welcome yeah. to DC." He's not making no you, decisions. That's unbelievable. And uh, uh, but anyway, well, going yeah. back to what you were saying, Jared. Uh, let me. I didn't want to interrupt you, but go ahead. No, so it, no, that was it. I just I was specifically asking as we welcome Mutanda. Uh, greetings. Uh, I was just there asking for an update, really, on the on the MLS. If there was more discussion about their response to Palestinian support, I just know that or... they banned all "quote unquote" national flags. Now, yeah, of course, that's still, yeah, that's... that's still you know that's still a statement, but um, because the only flag that you see a national flag is the, is the U.S. flag, right? And that's that in and of itself is a statement. Um, but I know that they specifically came out with that post October the 7th to make sure that nobody showed up at stadiums with uh, Palestinian flags. It's just unbelievable. What's up, Mutanda? How you feeling? Greetings. Good to see you again. What's going on, family? How are we doing? 
Good, good, good. Just catching up on the on the latest and the greatest, and and, and obviously the entire soccer world is is uh, from ownership on down, standing in solidarity with Palestinians, and it's just great. It's great <laughs> to see. It's just, <laughs> no, I hear you. Uh, my apologies for my lateness, um, but it's great to see you all. And and uh, it's a little bit earlier where I am. So, oh, right. Oh, okay, right, right, right. in Seattle. It's, a, it's, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's but like, I, it's, what is it? Nine 30 there? Eight 30 there? What is it? Uh, eight 30 now. Yeah. Eight 30 now, but it's, it's good to see you all. Daniel. What's welcome, up, man? Welcome back. Um, no, catch me, catch me up. What's, what's, what's I mean, we just did it. We did a quick recap on Daniel's trip to Uganda and, and a, not even a recap, but a quick, you know, word or two on that. And then, yeah. Yeah, we. I'm happy to go back to that, and then we did also a, a quick uh, uh, look at um, the Zyron interview I sent late in the group chat, just talking a little bit about how um, m many in the soccer world are attempting to support Palestine and are being suppressed and and punished for it. Yeah. Uh, to yep. the extent that that one at least uh, uh, player losing his contract, and I just read this morning the headline that he's suing. He's going to sue Mainz for for yep. that. And uh, I wish him well. And uh, so, so, so maybe that's how we'll get some non-white ownership. You know, it's maybe really, we'll it's end really up suing them into ownership. <laughs> no, it's, it's really crazy. interesting. I've been wondering whether there's a, you know, because Germany has this whole thing of fan ownership, right? By law, like the fans have to control the clubs in Germany in the Bundesliga. And there are a couple of clubs, um, Union Berlin for one. And St. Pauli for the other. I think I'm not sure where St. Pauli is located. I'm not sure if they're in Berlin or not. But they're two, you know, what you'd call clearly teams on the left, politically speaking. Their fan base is, you know, is usually pretty aggressive in terms of social positions. And I was really wondering whether or not, because of the fan ownership issue in Germany, whether Germany has, generally speaking, been more lenient on the fan side of the equation and it sounds like based on this you know the player from mains that got fired it's you know the, the fans don't have the control i you would think that they would be they would have you know based on that that rule that that requires them to have control um and that's just an aside i mean i you know i'm i think that money talks I and mean, that's just what's going on you know, people that pull the purse strings are the people that are controlling the media and that's dictating the message. Mm. Right on. But Jared, you said something yeah. about something you read in the book. I, I forgot. Well, you... yeah, I mean, so there's a, there's actually a few things from just, just in the postscript, which is not, I mean, it's not even, there's just, there's, there's a lot actually, I've been reading intermittently back and forth your book but but mm -hmm. in, just in the postscript there's so many things that that i think are so you even mentioned uh uh just as you talked there about this issue of community ownership and you were saying so part of this is that you're writing this in the years before in in the years after the u.s mexico and canada had won the bid for the 26 2020 20, 2026 world cup and but but, but but before, so after that decision had been made, but before uh, um, some more recent updates on this issue that I was not clear on that you write about between U.S. soccer and U.S. soccer federation, which oh, yeah. is that's, confusing. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, but your point, in, at least my point in, in referencing that is that you referenced that to describe how, and I can't remember which did which, one of those basically was wanting to get rid of the other's involvement in world in U.S. soccer because they did not want, as some are confused into thinking, winning the World Cup to turn into having soccer in this country, that is the United States, become more popular, but in fact are using the World Cup and its presence in the United States with, as you point out, 60 of the 80 games playing in NFL stadiums to defend the National Football League. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just to, just to clarify the nomenclature. Um, Thank you. So the lawsuit that was brought was brought by U.S. Soccer. The legal name of U.S. Soccer 
is the United States Soccer Federation. It's, it, it's, the, the letters are USSF. Um, that's the organization that represents FIFA in the United States. And supposedly, they enforce FIFA's rules. Supposedly. Hmm. There is another organization in the United States called the U.S. Soccer Foundation. Which is right, I think the federation based, versus I, the foundation. Sorry, yeah, that was my confusion. Yeah. Right. And the foundation is based in DC and it is traditionally it's had a relationship with US soccer. Traditionally, right? Um, but they announced um, prior to winning the bid for the 2026 World Cup, they announced that they were going to roll out a nationwide program to to bring, I think it was a thousand soccer fields to the inner city all across the country and u.s soccer went crazy and literally filed suit against them to stop them from doing that so that should tell you something well i want you to tell us why you said it happened because that to me is i i think it happened for a couple of reasons one the u.s soccer foundation is headed and i don't know this person personally but he's his name is ed simeon i think his name is ed simeon he's black and he has been at that organization for a number of years and has been pretty silent you know he's not what you'd call a public person aside from the role that he plays in the foundation he's not in the newspaper a lot he's He's behind the scenes. Um, But I think what happened clearly is that the idea of bringing the game into the inner city and particularly, and this wasn't, you know, we're not just talking, you know, Baltimore and inner city Cleveland and inner city St. Louis. We're talking also L.A. into the barrios of L.A. and, you know, and Houston and that kind of stuff. So it was basically an attempt to take the sport to the two demographics that have largely been excluded from the sport in the United States. Right. Um, And so when I, when I saw that and I didn't get a chance to read the, you know, the filings, the legal filings, they, as far as I know, they settled out of court, but it was a, it was a lawsuit where they literally asked for an injunction. I mean, they were going to, they tried to stop this dude from rolling this program out and the program got stopped. I mean, it was halted. And they also were very concerned with the use of the name United States Soccer Federation, because they felt that the, that the name Soccer Federation uh, Foundation was confusing and it's confusing to everybody because you think it's, it's one and the same organization, you know, but they were two different hats and two different organizations. And so there was an attempt to, to get them to change their name, which I think they backed off of. I think the U.S. Soccer Foundation did not have to change their name. But, you know, in the lead up to the World Cup in 2026, you don't see US, the U.S. Soccer Foundation in the news doing anything. I mean, if they were rolling out a, a, a thousand inner city soccer fields across the country, that would be news for somebody. And right now it's not news for anybody. I don't, to, to the best of my knowledge, nothing's being done in the inner city. Now, you know, maybe in, in the lead up to the world cup, something will happen, but I just don't think that that's, that's something that well, U.S. soccer wants to see happen. Can I just, can I just, because, so you, I just want to highlight and make it clear your argument, because as you lay out in your book, is, 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 and you said it again in the postscript, the NFL doesn't want to compete with soccer for its primary talent pool in black America. They don't Absolutely. want to have to, they don't want those black kids going to the soccer field. So they're going to, they're not, no now way. I just want to, I do want to also say, I want to encourage people to stay tuned to our mix what I like, because in the coming months and years, uh, um, I don't, I don't think I'm clear to say anything more on this yet, but there is going to be a collaborative effort here and elsewhere with uh, I'll say black journalists who want to try to take advantage of the World Cup as much as possible by going to each of these communities in cities where the games are going to be played and raising questions about 
both the money going in to support the World Cup and not to the communities themselves. And also this question of why isn't soccer ever being promoted and encouraged and developed within black communities here in the United States? So well, I know you, I'm going to support that effort. I'd, I'd, and, love, and I'd love to get more involved with that because I'll keep you informed. I'll let what, you know. I'm not spearheading the, it, pun intended, I guess, but I, uh, um, <laughs> but, there, there, but there I am going to, uh, I don't know. But you know. Lutanda probably knows more than I do about, you know, inner city initiatives for the sport because I've run across a couple of groups in the United States that are backed not by black folks, but by, you know, Anglos that are pushing the idea of the sport in the inner city. Now, I don't know where those programs are. I don't know how much they've done. Um, I know there's a program in Harlem, you know, there's a, there's a Harlem FC uh, group that's, that's being led by a, brother in Harlem. I don't know his name. I'm not even up to speed but on which what you're Harlem? doing. Well, you mean, you mean in terms of what, what, you gentrifying mean, Harlem? Like, is, it, oh, is this, well, is this part I of mean, the new Harlem or is this the Harlem Harlem? Hey man, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I wish I could tell you, I, you know, I suspect that sounds suspicious. I, I, suspect, <laughs> I suspect if it's consistent. No, I know. I'm just playing this. Through, this yeah. No, but I, I'm totally with you because this sport generally speaking <laughs> is a bourgeois sport. You know, I mean, it's a bourgeois sport. I mean, this is not like you're not you're not getting people out of the hood or the barrio streaming, fighting to get on the onto the playing field with this sport. It's 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 the exact opposite. It's the bourgeoisie. It's people who have the best educations, the most money, et cetera, et cetera. Whether you're black, white or brown or yellow or whatever, it's all bourgeois. Um, hey, and just and just, I, I just, think that's exactly the problem. I just just to be. I just looked this up quickly. This is apparently Harlem FC. Yeah, there it is. So shout out to them. Go ahead. Go ahead, fellas. Now that, you know, just to lay it on the line, um, the guy that runs this thing is a brother. And his, you know, let's put nice. it this way. His, his financial backing, if you can say that, is um, a, a good portion of it is coming from MLS. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Well, and ML, and we didn't we didn't talk about this the last time, but maybe Mutanda can speak to this issue. There is an organization that's kind of a, a an arm of MLS called Black Players for Change, which basically consists of black players in MLS who, you know, created their own organization to deal with issues that they felt were important in the context of MLS. Um, this is um, December, I'd say maybe six months ago, maybe longer than that, sometime this year, I think, they were looking for an executive director. And the executive director that they found was somebody who came directly out of MLS. So it's... Um, it's kind of like, you know, I hate to say it, but that that character in uh, that Samuel Jackson played in in in, uh, oh, in no. Django. Oh no! I mean, you know what I mean. I mean, it's Damn. like you know, Stephen. Got to got to keep them Negroes in check. You know what I mean? Um, so so so, uh, wait, so this is not a sign that your thesis is being challenged. That in other words, on the this contrary, is not a sign that 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 the NFL's uh, what's the what's, what's what's on the about? Click the about. Like like who made this? Sorry. Supposedly they're the black players of there, and there are a number of black players. Um, it's just that I found it interesting. Instead of finding somebody who was, you know not under the control of major league soccer they found somebody who came out of major league soccer to lead their organization Hold right on. if i may yeah go ahead yeah go ahead i mean i know i know you probably have some ideas about this man and i know that you've got this mls collect connection and i don't want to put you in hot water brother but you know <laughs> it is what it is are you saying I'm an op? Is that what you're saying? Oh, <laughs> hey, 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 but I'm not saying you're an op, man. I'm just no, saying, I'm you know, you got that you got that relationship. It was something important for your I do. So for your career. I you know? And I don't mean to name drop, but I'm I'm going to because this is because you're right. And I'm 
I'm going to, but to, to further, because the point we made and the point, Jared, you just made about like when you look up these organizations um, and the, the people doing this work around the country in these communities who look like us, um, it, it actually, yes, furthers the point you make so eloquently in your book, Robert, because it's like anything else politically where essentially, if I can be crude, it, it basically comes across as massa just allowing us certain crumbs from the table. Yeah. Right. If I can put it that way. And, and um, you know, my experience from it has uh-huh. been, so I've actually, I've met Mr. Simeon who leads this. Year oh, so, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, virtually. Um, I've also met with the commissioner of, of MLS uh, virtually a while ago. What um, on one or in a group? Uh, I think with just one other person. So it was a small group, it was mm-hmm. a small group. Uh, and there's a whole history there we don't need to get into because essentially I was when it wasn't just black players for change, but in my time in Columbus, when everything kicked off uh, with the uprising in the streets. Uh, let me put it this way. I will say I wasn't I wasn't as politically uh i wasn't as politically educated as as i feel i am now uh and and to the degree that i was i don't know if i was if i was really standing on principle in the same way or if i was aware of the circles i was in because essentially in those i was in discussions with people from black players for change and with the mls about what they could do in that corporate space to sort of I, again, I don't want to say quell because I, I'm sure they wouldn't, they didn't think of it that way, but essentially to appease the masses, if you will. Right. Mm-hmm. And as I step back from it in the, and so I guess what I'm saying is and not to, there's some good people doing work. Right. But it's it, when you step back and you look at sort of what is actually being done in front offices or all around the country and in M, and in MLS, it's nothing short of just, towing a certain line that fits politically along the same lines that uh, we see these big institutions and certainly the nation take when it comes to all these big issues, whether it's Palestine or whether it's, you know, what's going on in, in, in communities of color all around this country. And it's a, and it's a very, uh, even if it's somewhat liberal, it's a pretty conservative line. You know, so when it comes to what's being, you know, the fact that soccer is played in communities of color all around this country is is something that they know. It's a fact. They know it. And so my frustration with the league, uh, even when I was there, and especially now as I'm not involved in it, my frustration has always been, uh, and again, to your point, Robert, because I think you're spot on. I really do. You know that this happens. You have all these resources. And the only interest that MLS really has is continuing to grow the hegemon that is MLS and to control soccer from that standpoint. And this is why I don't know if you guys are aware of like the news recently about the Open Cup. Oh, and yeah. MLS, and yeah. MLS pulling its first teams. Right. But then and then that was kind of smacked back by U.S. soccer. And that's a, just a great example of this this relationship that MLS has with the game here. The people who run it. And I can say this pretty definitively. The people who run it, I don't even know if they really care about soccer, right? And they certainly don't really don't care about, like, you know, revolutionary politics, right? What they want is they want MLS to be the end-all and be-all of soccer on the continent, on the continent, right? Because it, this is beyond the U.S. Because this is why they have the relationship that they have with League MX, for example. Right, um, yeah, they're, they're so playing they that, want MLS North, that North American game. They want North American dominance, right, which is why yeah. obviously the World Cup coming and being a quote-unquote North American tournament, it's an MLS tournament, yeah, right? an NFL tournament, right, and same. So, no, I'm, I'm very intimately aware with, with, with that world, and it's, uh, yeah, and but I also want to say, like, uh, last thing, last point I'll make, like the rising point, is, is one such organization, right? My organization. And there are others. Um, in DC, there's an organization that that's, um, I'm, um, 
I, w- I wanted to say open goal project, but I'm, it may not be the exact name, but there's so many, there are lots of people around the country doing this work. But the problem is just like a lot of political organizations, if we're isolated and, or we're not, you know, organized, um, we don't have resources. Uh, it's hard to actually make things sustainable and move the needle. And when, what ends up happening is it, it becomes people's own charity projects that, 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 you know, serve a little bit, but don't go bigger. Uh, and, or the very worst case, you know, people's own vanity projects, right. Where they, they try to essentially create systems that don't actually serve the kids. So, um, yeah, that's where we're at, but, um, yeah, hopefully that sheds some light into, into that as well. From Just to clarify this NFL connection for the world cup, um, I did some research on the stadia that are being used. So there are 11 stadia in the United States that are being used. Um, I think there are three or four in Mexico and two or three in Canada. I can't remember the exact number, but there are 11 in the United States. All of the 11 in the United States are NFL stadia. But the interesting thing about that is that if you do a comparison of the average capacity of those stadia for the World Cup, the average capacity is somewhere around 70,000. And this World Cup, for the first time, will be an expanded World Cup. So instead of 32 teams, I think it'll be 48 teams. So there's kind of like, you know, they're kind of bringing in-house what previously were um, the elimination round in countries around the world. They're bringing some of those elimination rounds now into the World Cup and and kind of structuring the World Cup so that it, it's got more games than otherwise it used to. And my, my pitch on this thing is, is, is maximization of, of revenue. Right? How much revenue is going to be generated from these from these games um i think russia i think the last or not maybe maybe it was Qatar, but you know they generate over 10 billion a year for the world cup uh, when it happens every four years and my my spiel on basically how the sport is structured in the united states today is that the money that they generate from the stadium and from TV and from commercial and everything else, which is totally under FIFA's control, this World Cup, um, is going to contribute to the status quo. That the, the basic game plan of U.S. soccer and FIFA and the NFL is that who controls the sport doesn't change. And that with the additional revenue that they generate from the World Cup, they can dig themselves even deeper into the control side of the game and not change anything, really. So that you come in 2027, they're even trying to get the Women's World Cup for 2027, so they may get that too. But um, the basic game plan is we'll have more of a treasure chest to play with to keep things exactly the way they are. Um, And I think that's the game plan. Um, FIFA is FIFA is complicit, obviously, because they're if you if you're on Twitter, I mean, I'm sure I'm not sure if you guys follow Twitter and and football soccer as closely as as some people do, but there is a there's a grassroots riot on Twitter about this sport in the United States. And the, the riot and the dissent has to do with MLS and MLS's control of U.S. soccer. I mean, U.S. soccer is viewed as a subsidiary of MLS. And mm. I, I speak about this in the book as well. But um, I did some research on college stadia that would be available for the World Cup. And if... If the United States Soccer Federation said, uh, we want to reconsider using NFL stadia and we want to use the top college football stadia for the World Cup, 
the average size of capacity for using, let's say, the top 11 largest college football stadium, the average would be 90,000 per seat, per seat. Right. So you're giving up. I mean, let's say you the tickets are fifty dollars. You know, fifty dollars a whop. She fifty dollars. I mean, maybe tickets I'm, gonna be fifty dollars. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm. Let's hypothetically. You could be a hundred. That's not even it's, parking, it's, Robert. Uh, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of money made. What I'm saying is, if they want if if they were interested in maximizing revenue, they wouldn't be using all NFL stadium. Just in terms of capacity, because, you know, college football in the United States is very sophisticated. Now, it may not be as sophisticated as, you know, uh, you know, the Dallas Cowboys Stadium in terms of concessions. But in terms of tickets, in terms of fannies in the seats, I mean, which is really where the big money is. You're giving up a pretty serious piece of change by doing NFL Stadium. In the United I States. saw Penn State play Miami. In, in the Orange Bowl in 1990-something, 100,000 100, plus say, packed that, in there. That must have been a big one, yeah. It was insane. And, you've, yeah. and I've been to many pro-American football games, baseball, nothing, nothing has been like that. The size yeah, I, of the state is not – go ahead, Daniel. Go no, ahead. I was going to say I think you'll find the most attended football game, meaning soccer game, in the United States was a friendly – at Michigan Stadium between Real Madrid and Manchester United in maybe 2015, 16, 17, somewhere there. Yeah. It was like a hundred thousand people. I don't know what Michigan's stadium is. I think called, it's hundred I think it's 107. Something like that. So I think that might be the most attended football match in the United States, like in its history. So And it didn't um, involve any US teams. <laughs> exactly. No, no, it was it was Madrid you against know, United. You know, which really, which well, just, yeah. just 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 quickly, Robert. And this goes to the point. Next year, no, in 2025, almost next year, um, FIFA are making a Club World Cup. So the Club World Cup, as we know it right now, is, you know, the Japanese champions, basically the champions of the Copa Libertadores. So generally a Brazilian team, cha champions of the Champions League and somebody from the, the, the Asian Federation. They all come together and where, wherever they play it. And the European team generally wins unless you're Chelsea in 2013 and you lose to Corinthians. Um, but FIFA have decided to expand this competition from eight teams and basically how many games would that be? It's like, it's like six, seven, eight games or something like that. And now they want to bring 32 teams to one place and generally, ha and ge yeah, genuinely have a world cup, but just of club teams. And that's going to be held within the United States in 2025. So June and July of 2025, they're going to have a FIFA Club World Cup. Um, wow. And, and I, if, if you do the research, I wonder where the games were, were, are going to be held. Probably yeah. NFL stadiums. But yeah. it's, it's because they got rid of the Confederations Cup, it's almost like a run or a, a trial or trial run of what will happen in 2026 when the actual World Cup goes to the United States for all intent and purpose. Wow. Yeah, and it's a joke because it, on on a couple several on on several fronts um even when you look at it from just the player welfare point of view. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is and this I mean we're talking about football is is our main topic here and it's like people criticize of course prof professional athletes for certain stances sometimes because they don't give them the benefit of the doubt because hey you earn you know an incredible amount of money to, to play a game at the same time you have these players who are saying all the time yo we're playing too many games right first of all oh, yeah. it's not a game anymore they're not playing a game people really yes. need to stop saying like I, not that you're I don't, no, but no, no, that, I it needs to be just like they're 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 professionals they're workers yes they're, they're workers yeah, that's, yeah and they're they're uh, to your point and I'll, i don't want to cut you off entirely but they're they're yeah. they're abusing their bodies they're playing way too much yeah. way yeah. too much uh and breaking down that's why players have fallen apart all over the place well, and it's easier. So, and it, here's the thing: is this is where my appreciation for uh, laborers in American sports has 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 uh, changed as well. 
you know, because it how many times do people hear like, oh, uh, so and so running back or 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 wide receiver is holding out and they get mad at the player. Right. And they're like, oh, that. and so we have this like even within us. Right. Even given our like collective experience on this continent uh, with labor and all that and exploitation of said labor, we still get conditioned to side with the bosses. And it's ridiculous because at the end of the day, the, the, the brothers kicking ball, you know, in this this Club World Cup who are, who are coming up like they literally if, if they make if they have the success and their team makes it to that tournament, they have no break. That's mm-hmm. what that means. The top players have no break unless those clubs. Right. Whether it's Man City, Real Madrid, whoever makes it uh, uh, unless those clubs basically say now nah, we're going to like you don't need to come to this trip. You need to come on this trip. Let's say the, the, the big stars. So, you know, Erling Holland, Kevin De Bruyne, whatever, like maybe just chill at home. But hey, there's a problem with that. The bosses don't want that. Hell no. Who puts, who puts, who puts the fannies in the seats? Kevin De Bruyne, Jude Bellingham, the superstars of the global game. So it's literally written in contracts that these brothers have to play a certain amount of it. Right. So Messi, all these people like this isn't this isn't a game. Right. This isn't a game. And it's I watched the ticket prices. I was looking in D.C. I was going to surprise my daughter and take her to see to see Messi when he was coming Mm -hmm. to D.C. And 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 a regular D.C. ticket like I got to like just to go to a regular D.C. uh, 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 game, United game. You know, I got to think about it in terms of the cost of the travel, the meal, the tickets, the this, the that, you know, I'm a bit, you know, we always could get something. So it's a little bit of a of an event. But I saw a jump. It went from like three hundred to three thousand when Messi Holy, was coming that's into town. That's yeah, they were selling tickets three thousand dollars, Robert, to go to go and to then, see a DC you, United you know, game with, with Messi were, on the field. There were people who were complaining because they bought like three, four, five, ten thousand dollar tickets ahead, uh, anticipating that Messi would be playing these games. Then he got a hamstring yeah. injury and he wasn't playing. So people were like, I paid $10,000 and Messi's not here. It's like, well, ain't nobody tell you to do that. Ain't nobody tell but, you to do that. And it's not his fault he's pulling a hamstring because right. he just played I mean, 7,000 games in six he's, weeks. He's, he's, he's coming after a World Cup. Like, he didn't really have a, any really time to rest and all that. And he's so. what, 30? What is he? 36. What, 36, 30. Yeah, he's old for soccer. Like, he's up there yeah, for like, to be playing like there. this. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, so, yeah, I... You, to show you how bad it is, to show you how bad it is, two weeks ago, the Brazilian national championship finished, right? And um, and Fluminense, as you know, went to the club championship, got their butts kicked by Man City. I don't know if anybody saw that game. Um, I, I saw the highlights. The highlights. Oh, I saw it. I'm in some interesting <laughs> conversations about that game because it, Man. it contracts it. Contracts I'd, it I'd, love, I'd love to talk to you about that game. but yeah, No, yeah, no, no. We're going to. Wait. No, wait. But, yeah. Wait. Make okay. your point, Robert. Then I want to hear this, though. <laughs> but, but I want to hear that. Beautiful. But, 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 no, this is a big – it's a big um, discussion in yeah. some circles is on social media about the contrasting styles and all that. But, but yeah, go ahead, Robert. So, so, so ch- check this out. The way Brazil works, the way the Brazilian football season works, right? I mean, you have, you know, divisions just like Europe. You know, you have promotion and relegation and all that stuff, right? And Santos this year got relegated, which is like a big deal. But the fact of the matter is, is that these dudes get basically a month off. That's basically it. Because... In mid-January, the season starts again. And they start with, you know, what they call the local the local tournaments. So they start with the state championships. And so they don't get more than four weeks off. It's it's absolutely incredible. And if you're playing for a team that's that's winning, you know, you're going to go to the Libertadores, you're going to go to Copa America. You go, you, I mean, you've got all these additional games, you know. So they are, I mean, these guys are, and they have no union. There's no, there's no union in Brazil. Hmm. The players don't have unions. And the football clubs, if you can believe this, I mean, there's certain clubs that have disproportionate bargaining power with the media. So Corinthians, because Corinthians has such a big fan base, and Flamengo, which has the biggest fan base, right? 
the the teams negotiate they're trying to break out of this but right now the teams negotiate directly with the television provider TV Global and they negotiate direct contracts for that particular club to be on TV with TV, with TV Global they're trying to they're trying to break that down now um there's a group called Mubadala which is from the Middle East which is trying to negotiate the creation of a supposed league where they would split you know the money's more evenly but there's a you know there's a real you know mentality down here of of fiefdoms you know and uh, the clubs are the clubs don't trust one another um, and it's it's it creates this incredible habit just when you when you walked out Jared I was just saying there's the players no, I heard it I can oh, hear. Okay. You. Okay. Okay. I hear everything. I can hear everything. Okay. So the, that's what I was. The, yeah, the yeah, fact yeah. that the players don't have a union says says all you need to know. I mean, there's no union mm-hmm. at all. You know, and the clubs are basically rivals. You know, they don't trust each other to be part of the same TV package. You know, and obviously the media plays them off against one another. So it's it's a it's a mess down here. Yeah. So, so Matanda, what is this debate about the playing style? What, what, what are you talk? What are you making reference to there? Well, Daniel, you smirk. What have you, what have you heard, Daniel? <laughs> no, I was just. <laughs> he, he called it back. It's the for, for for me. It would maybe be because I haven't heard the debate, but I would assume it would be because Fluminense is coached by Fernando Denis or however you pronounce it in uh brazil and he has his own interpretation of how people are it's it's like a, it's a different style compared to the european style and manchester city is the i don't know quintessential way of how europeans are playing football at the moment so it's kind of like the clash of how brazil might see it or denise anyway and guardiola so i'd assume that's what it is so that's what my but we should also is. point out for those who are not aware that man city is is considered one of the top teams in the world uh, i think what are they third or fourth now in the league They're, but but expected to to rival for winning it and they have one of the biggest payrolls and in fact if i remember correctly the payroll may have gotten too big and they may be suffering some major penalty coming uh if i'm not mistaken like so so i think just in terms of the context for those not aware of what we're talking about yeah. when when this massive club plays uh, a smaller brazilian club for this this title but mutanda please go ahead i think you want to say more no about my oh. I, I think uh so what's been happening is yes yeah, so dinez daniel summed it up pretty well like the What's, good guess. Good guess. Good guess. <laughs> <laughs> the fascination um, with Dinez is on a, and I think Robert, this, I would be interested in. I have a question for you after because he's he's not like the most popular person in Brazil. He has his detractors in Brazil. I'm, I'm, for I'm, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah. But what, what's fascinating about his Fluminense team is, yes, the, the way in which they go about playing the game, playing the sport, is um, is reminiscent of it, it takes people back to an era when Brazil played this style and was known for it and won with it, right? This, this you know, like if you want to call it football functional, right? This idea of um, a free-flowing, interchanging, um, uh, hi- hyper hyper flare driven essentially more i guess you could say creative control given to the players is the way that a lot of people are describing it rather than a more i guess and again this is how others describe it because i necessarily i did i have my disagreements with this but more like a top-down control more uh machine-like sort of european model of playing in certain positions and the terms that have been thrown around especially certain uh their writers who uh who are intelligent about football write very well about it but um coaches and analysts whatever but one one per gentleman in particular who kind of coined the term uh, relationism as it as it That's refers to the yeah. team because the players are sort of they're they're occupying different positions and it, the field does not look 
symmetrical when they play, uh, as opposed to when you watch like a city in Guardiola teams and, and the other coaches who have a more like defined positions for their players. Like, hey, the right winger stays rare, the left winger stays there, and you can kind of cut the field in half and you can see, you know, symmetry. And then play, people play from those positions. So these kind of contrasting styles. Now, my big issue with it is this, or or not issue, I guess, but more so what they – I think people do a lot when they project sort of this idea that a more positional style of play is sort of – is less – is like they, they take my, my big issues with it, they take the human element out of it. And so my my issue is with the premise that, for example, the player's relationship with space is somehow different in a relationist side than it is with a positionist side. Meaning fo- footballers are constrained by space and time. That's universal. That's that doesn't change. Like the game is constrained by space and time. The more space you have on the field, the more time you have to do whatever you want to do. What Fluminense's team does, and yes, I agree, it is a different style, and it is, it's amazing what they do. <clears throat> but what they do cannot be divorced from – we can't analyze it uh, – um, we can't analyze it in a vacuum. So what they do, obviously, is dependent also on what the opposition does, right? Meaning, let's say, for example, just thought experiment – when Dinez moves all of his players or when the players move to one side of the field, they call that like a tilt, which is, which is a trademark of what they do. Sometimes they'll have eight or nine players really close to the ball, which really is very unique. They do that, though, as a function of trying to progress the ball up the field, right? So form follows function. They're not doing it just because it's – something that just looks cool or they think it looks cool because that's ridiculous like that. It doesn't happen in a vacuum and that needs to be involved in the analysis of it. Right. So when they have the, when we talk about them having this fluid style and it's daring and it's bold, it's also because of what they ask the opposition to do. And if you have that many players close to the ball, what's the opposition going to do? They're going to come and try to get the ball because they also bring players close to it, especially if you're doing this action close to your own goal. Right. Because when you're close to your own goal, obviously the opposition is like, hey, if we steal the ball here, we can score. So then what happens is you get this sort of tapestry of high risk passes in a short in a short in a in a closed area. And you get dribbles in areas where people are like, "Ooh, I don't know if I want to dribble there. And it becomes this exciting thing, which is beautiful. And then if Fluminense is able to suck the opposition into these areas, once they break, they find open space and they find areas to then hurt the opponent and then score. And that's kind of their style, which is beautiful. Now, what I've, what I've just expressed there, though, is stylistically, yes, aesthetically different from what a Man City does. But in its essence, in terms of luring the opponent to one side and then hurting them on the other side, it's not, I don't want to say the exact same because obviously it's very different, but it's in the discussions about relationism versus positionism what people are forgetting is that it's like uh at the end of the day the player's relationship with space doesn't change you know and and i'll finish up by saying this the main argument that i'm going against is there's this this mythology going around that uh a a more positionist style uh views space as something as something flat or static and objective whereas dinez and fluminense view space as something dynamic and alive. And my my contention is, no, even in a more positionist style. So Man City, for example, the players arrange themselves in a certain way, but that's because of their own context, the players that they have, and the way in which they feel that they can progress the ball up the field to score. However, even in that style, or even in that system, space is alive. Space is not static. I, Guardiola doesn't believe that space is static and objective. Because space is made alive in part because of the qualities of the players, right? So space is not just purely something uh, – space in football is not purely something objective. It's actually objective and subjective, right? Objectively, the 18-yard box is 18 yards, right? In Brazil, in Manchester, it's 18 yards. 
But space is also subjective, meaning let's say I give 10 yards of space to Messi uh, near the goal area. That's very dangerous. If I give 10 yards of space to Daniel, maybe it's less dangerous. No. <laughs> you know what I'm because of the, why? Because of the qualities of those players. So anyway, that's my and, – and when we discuss these things, if we don't discuss those in those terms, I'm reminded of that Kwame Ture quote where he says, when you make an analysis – of an oppressed people and you leave out the oppressor, you'll never come to a, a, a an accurate analysis of the of the people. The same can be applied to football. When we make an analysis of a team and we leave out the opponent, you can't come to an accurate analysis of the team. So we need to do the same. That was very team. dope. <clears throat> and oh, I love I, yeah, I was like, Ray working Jerry, that in at the Jerry, I love that. that was dope. Jerry came off mute. The people didn't see it. But as soon as Kwame Ture was mentioned, off mute. <laughs> So, 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 so let, let, let me uh, let me add let me add a wrinkle to uh, to Matanda because uh, this last statement you made Matanda about you can't forget about the oppressor is uh, a key factor in the discussion, particularly in this part of the world, right? Um, because the the kind of I don't if you want to call it representationalism or whatever that that word is being used to describe what Denise is trying to do, the debate in this part of the world, particularly in Brazil and Argentina, has always been about something that they call futebol força, which is, you know, muscle football, which is basically what Europe does, and futebol arte, the art of football, which is what, you know, Brazil symbolically stands for, right? And then the la I think the last session we had, we talked about the fact that uh, the yellow card and red card matrix, which has been imposed on the sport, was only introduced in 1970 at the 1970 World Cup in Mexico. And in large measure, it was the result of Pelé getting hacked out of the 1960 world, 1966 World Cup in England. I mean, the, the outrage globally was so great that they had to do something to rein in the fouls, which in some sense, as, a, as an aside, you know, adds to the, to the mythology surrounding Pelé, right? Because everything that Pelé did, there were, there were basically no fouls. You could foul and there were no consequences. And I think that the fact that you can foul still, and there, there's basically no consequences, is part of the problem with the game. And that's part of the European, you know, settler colonial control mechanism that still operates out of Europe. I mean, well, now they just blame Neymar and everybody for uh, trying to disrespect players and hold the ball too long, and they deserve... The, the 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 punishment and so on and so forth so yeah it's, maybe i mean it's but interesting, you know, it, it's a, that's I, but i'm just I, saying I, that's an interesting twist like I that's just, an interesting i just think that what i just think that what mutanda was talking about i mean let's face it this sport is controlled by europe it's controlled by uefa it's controlled by fifa and now of course we know that certainly in the in the western hemisphere in the, in the americas um the sport is controlled by the NFL in the United States. That's this Danny, you don't point. agree? Oh, no. I was just thinking that's a perfect segue to get into the audacious greed and theft and the... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I did, because yeah. I noticed the time. We're, we're almost 90 minutes in already, and we didn't yeah. get to the... To the, to the but just to, just, the, just to bring it home, I mean, what, mm -hmm. what, I, what I left out in the book and what I'm actually putting in the follow-on to the book, because I'm, I'm in the process of doing that, is that there, I think there needs to be a foul system, a personal and team foul system implemented for this sport, a la the NBA, exactly because it's a ball seal sport. And I think that obviously there'd be resist, resistance to do that, but there is a rules governing body that you probably have heard of, which is called IFAB, mm -hmm. which is something that FIFA is a part of, but the FIFA doesn't quote unquote control. And it's made up of, if I'm not mistaken, the members are FIFA, Wales, Ireland, Scotland, and the UK. 
right? So now, let's, that's, let's, if that's not let, a colonial control mechanism, I don't know what it is. Let's let's let that be part of the the, the tease for the next conversation. The, yeah. the discussion of turning the, the making football rules, making the NBA rules apply you know, to football for you know that's for, actually a good and, starting point at least from my point about the super go ahead League, if we could yeah so if you take england wales scotland ireland all of those teams you, you know england or just we could just say the 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 british isles and ireland it's confusing in some ways but you know um those islands up there they had this thing called the the home nations cup so the for the first three world cups in 1930 34 and 38 they didn't go so there was no england there was no scotland there was no wales there was no ireland there was none of those dudes they were just like we're not going because we don't believe in this and for me i feel like if you look there's a thread throughout kind of english football or british football more 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 accurately even the 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 carabao cup was in response to the European Cup made by the by the newly formed UEFA in 1954 I believe is when UEFA were founded. The English teams didn't go to the first European Cup. Chelsea were the champions in 1955 and the English FA was like, "Not, nah, you're not going." Um so Chelsea fans are always a bit kind of perturbed that they weren't able to go to the first one, but Real Madrid won the first five, Chelsea weren't going to win, so it's besides the point. But England are always standoffish. They don't they're, they're, they're not with this European project stuff. Like the, at every turn, there's opposition from the English or the British. Um, <laughs> so when I when 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 the when the idea of a Super League comes up, and the Premier League teams and Premier League fans are like, no, 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 we're not going. We don't want it. We don't want it. We don't want it. It's just it's in line and it's it's consistent with their behavior. Not to mention the idea of a Super League would be bad for the dominance that the Premier League has on world football as it stands. C creating an opportunity for clubs in Spain, Italy, France, Germany to make more money, to therefore compete with City, Liverpool, United, Chelsea, Arsenal, Tottenham, Newcastle, etc. Why would they be interested in doing that? And then not just the clubs, obviously the clubs might want to make more money, but why would the Premier League itself want that? The current status quo or just the status quo is beneficial to the Premier League. They don't need to build something else that would then compete with them or allow other teams to compete with them. So that's kind of my opening point on, on the Super League. So, <clears throat> and I'm happy to have one of you break down exactly what the Super League is and how it's going to be structured. But I thought, Daniel, mm -hmm. initially, the argument that the Premier League was trying to float in its initial support was that, no, I'm wrong already? No, the individual clubs wanted to join, but the but Premier the league, league didn't. But the league itself, I think, was never in support okay. of their teams okay. going to Europe. Or, 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 because or, I thought, or, or going but, to the Super League, rather. Because I thought this was a league that was going to be superimposed, as is the Champions League, on top of these existing leagues. And it would be, and the idea would be that it would, would return. Because I thought this was supposed to replace the Champions League. Yes, I think that's right. And then return money back to these leagues. I thought that was the pitch, at least, that these clubs were making, it's, that the leagues themselves would It would, would return benefit. money back to the clubs. So the clubs would have mm. more opportunity to make money for the work that they do, essentially. Um, so so yeah. the leagues themselves wouldn't make any money off of this? No. This, well, I mean, they would make money by virtue of their clubs being club in it, being but, in, but, but, in but it's not under their control. Right. Ne neither I, is UEFA to that to that point, but yeah. Mutanda, please take a you second and like, quickly tell well, us what the Super League is, though, too. Just well, so but you folks know what it's like. Essentially, it's funny because a lot of these things are misnomers mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because essentially, and and as Daniel lays out, the Premier League in itself is kind of a Super League already, right? If we're really real about it, when we talk about where money moves and who has power and whatever. And obviously the fact that, and, and let's be real, even some of the, even as it relates to, not to take the conversation back, but even as it relates to like Man City versus Fluminense, I was even talking about the result when I say that. So I want to be very clear because people will say that and be like, oh, he's not taking into account 
this, that, or the other. No, no, no. I'm just talking about styles. And I appreciate Dinez. I actually like and I admire like what Fluminense did. But when we when we talk about the way the game is going, these teams in these locales, so like Man City, the only thing English about Man City really is its location. Mm-hmm. Right? The owners have come from elsewhere. The the coaching staff and the, the 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 manager obviously comes from another place. The bulk of the players come from all over. So when we talk about super leagues and we talk about where football is going, a lot of this is really kind of like big money fighting with other big money over who can have the biggest sway in the world, right? Because one of the big driving forces here is, as Daniel mentions, like the fact that La Liga amongst other leagues and uh, Serie A, but especially like is really struggling. One thing we have to consider here is that Real Madrid, for example, and these clubs, uh, uh, Barcelona, these clubs are used to being the big, 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 big boys at the table. And they're not used to having other people dictate what's going on. And one big thing, too, driving this is that, uh, uh, especially when it comes to La Liga, when you take Real Madrid and Barcelona and you you know, kind of take them out, the league struggles, right? And they struggle to gain top talent. Especially now when you consider the Messi and Ronaldo have moved on. Um, it's good that for Real Madrid's sake that they have Jude Bellingham. They have a direct pipeline to Brazilian talent. Right? So again, the way and the way I would work this in as well with the style and the way things are playing. And, and like with Dinez, one thing I appreciate about him, he kind of he speaks about these things. He speaks about how the fact that Brazil in parts losing its identity because they're losing so many players to Europe. But that's when people make their analysis about styles of play and this and that. That also needs to factor because the fact is what we're really up against is capitalism. We need to question why is it that Real Madrid and Man City and Barcelona, all these teams, right, which people will argue, sometimes they'll argue from with their tribal hats on and they'll, 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 they'll try to do this morality play, right? And they'll try to make like Man City out to be out, for example, like the unique boogeyman. Ah, they're owned by, you know, Arab money and oil money as if they're singularly ruling the game. They don't say a damn word about how Real Madrid for years and years and years, right, run by the crown, right? Where did they get that money? And again, why is it? I ask you today, why is it that Real Madrid and other top teams can go to Brazil and sign a, a teenager for next to nothing and people think that this is normal? Like, it's not. Every Nobody's clean in this game. So when I, I get back to now this idea of the Super League, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's super, super league, right? Because again, even the Premier League is in, in a way a kind of a super league, but also the Champions League itself. Now, what we have now, the Champions League has morphed over time. It's grown. So even that's kind of a super league because it started out as first and foremost as only the winners of the domestic leagues, only the winners. And it was a much smaller tournament. And then it grew into what it is currently. And then now it's changing again to next year where they're changing up the rules. So it, it's it's really the same pattern. It's nothing different. And it's really just the same big forces in Europe competing for dominance of the sport with the additional fact, with the, the, the additional, obviously, influence ownership of, you know, the so-called Middle Eastern owners who are heavy hitters in this game as well, like increasingly, right? Saudi money in the game and all this. So... This is where we are. This is where we are. So, so because got pumped again. What I meant to say is because we got pumped again. And 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 the crowd has called for it. I'm I just in general, uh, uh, Mutanda, um, you deserve. Yeah, listen. That's called my boy. Know nothing about that. Yeah. So, uh, just wanted to make sure you got your 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 drops and flowers. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, but but just is there okay? Is there any? Yeah, I actually like that point. These are already. Uh, it's like super leagues competing with super leagues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, you don't think so, Daniel. You, Daniel, struggling with that one. You know, you why I, wouldn't a that... little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. In 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 the sense that the Super League 
oh, the 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 proposed European Super League, as I understand it, would be controlled in large part. Well, they the the Real Madrid, Barcelona, and Juventus essentially created this thing called A twenty two sports management and these are the people who are at the helm that are the front face of organizing this european super league. wait who did this real madrid barcelona and juve those are those are the three primary teams that want to jump off this or just start a juventus is the right? one of the top teams in the italian in league, just in case because yes. somebody's not aware and one of the most right. notorious for scandals <laughs> <laughs> yes. So they have essentially created this thing called A22. So I'm sure if you go to A22 Sports or you type that in Google, you can come up with, with this sports management group. Um, but for all intent and purpose, it is those three clubs. Now, when we look at... Because this is how I relate it, and maybe people would have a problem with it, but who cares? Um when Mutanda was talking about how, you know, he was, you, you want to support, like, let's say an NFL running back holds out to make the most money that he can because he's putting his body uh, in harm's way. And what fans tend to do is they'll side with management rather than the player because a, a fans, by, by a fan's mm -hmm. nature, they, they are attached to their club or their team doing well. And if a player stands in the way of that team's success, we will then blame the player for doing what's in their best interest rather than actually blaming the billionaire, millionaire, whoever is restricting um, how much money that work is actually worth. Once it becomes like football clubs, essentially as individuals versus a UEFA or a FIFA who are now that big corporation, I feel like the, the same dynamic kind of shifts. It goes from player a so, uh, player versus team to team versus association. So Real Madrid understand that how is it, or actually you is a better example. How is it that the relegated teams in the Premier League make more money than we do when we win 10 or 9 in a row Serie A's? You, so you're telling me Norwich and Southampton and all of these teams that get relegated, they make more money than us. How is, how, is this, how is this happening? It's happening because the Premier League is an incredible global phenomenon. TV we deals. Can, TV deals. This goes to colonization and everybody speaking English and the British, I'll never said on the British Empire, they have a built-in advantage to where everybody likes the Premier League or has been made to like the Premier League, whichever way. I mean, what's up, Italy? Y'all didn't colonize <laughs> right. I mean, you know what I'm saying? That's the spoils. Of, and it didn't work. You know, you know, you know. You're saying but, you should have been better imperialists. You're know saying? I'm, although, although, you know, Jared, you know, there's some. There's hold, some Robert, my bad. I didn't. For, forgive me for cutting you off, yeah. but I did cut Daniel off. No, I'm no, going to no, make yeah, sure yeah, he gets yeah, a yeah, chance. Yeah, 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 the, the, the Premier League is, as, as, as Mutanda says, its own version of a Super League. They even broke off from the English football pyramid to create the Premier League in 1992-93 when they realized we need to break this thing off and create our own and brand it differently. So clubs, and, and I don't know what it is in the minds of football fans, but it's just something where if if you see a club wanting to do something for themselves, they, they associate it with greed. And it is greed because this is the world in which we live. But the point is, if, 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 if Real Madrid, Barcelona, Juventus, AC Milan, whoever know that if we can do this by ourselves, UEFA is not necessary in order to run European football anymore. We can do this by ourselves. Why do we need them? But then fans look at it like you're being greedy. And of course, Florentino, Florentino Perez and Laporta, these are the presidents of Madrid and, and Barcelona. Yeah, we're being greedy. But for me, I'm looking at it like, how come they can't? Like, why shouldn't they be able to do this? That's that's that, that's what I'm standing because it, 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 it effectively UEFA and FIFA they're they're taking the stew they're 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 taking meat out the stew pot when it they don't like why you don't need to be so I'm sympathetic I think to the Super League idea especially when you look at how the Premier League is and how it came to be <clears throat> but you know I'll shut up I mean. 
so I'll admit my initial thought of this was this is the logic of imperialism to f- ever expand and reconquer or conquer new quote unquote new territory. But in y- y- that's a compelling argument. It's it, it you know the current. <laughs> I'm gonna have to let that marinate. Anybody else want to jump in? Well, I, that's yeah. I mean, here's here's I think the counter argument, or right? the counter argument is that the substitute for UEFA, which is what this Super League concept is, is basically a threat, not so much to the Premier League or La Liga or Serie A or League One or even the Bundesliga, which I want to come back to. It's really a threat to the lower divisions because what you're doing is concentrating the wealth creation mechanism at the top and supercharging it. So the lower division clubs are already struggling in every country in Europe, particularly the big five, right? The lower division clubs are struggling. One of the interesting things about the Premier League is that they have something called parachute payments. So that even if you get relegated, you get a parachute payment from the from the Premier League that cushions your fall to the to the lower division. And it's not an insubstantial amount of money. The point that I wanted to make, which I think is crucial, is that the settler colonial hegemony of the sport. And even even Johnny Infantino has said this publicly, is that the, the, the concentration of power financially, in terms of commercial, in terms of television, is Europe. He knows this. And he's actually said publicly that he thinks that that unipolar model for European football needs to change. My argument is that It ain't Saudi Arabia that's going to change this. The only country that's capable of challenging that monopoly is the United States. It's the only country that's capable of doing that. It's not China either. And they gave it a shot, but they blew it. And so my argument is that the reason the United States is a threat is because if, in fact, MLS became, you know, we don't have, you don't even have to have a a premier league in the United States. A Bundesliga would do just fine. And the distinction I make between the Bundesliga and the premier league is this. Last year, the Bundesliga generated about 4 billion euros in revenue. And I think the premier league was somewhere in the neighborhood of six to seven. The difference is that there's no debt in the German Bundesliga. Every team in the in in the EPL, in the English Premier League, has got billions in debt hanging over its head. And there's a great analyst that you guys may have heard of called it's it's a website called Swiss Ramble. So Swiss Ramble is a is a former accountant who basically spends his entire life analyzing football finances in Europe. And it's one of the most comprehensive analytic tools out there in terms of trying to give her some kind of an idea of where the money-making opportunities are, right? The debt that's in the English Premier League, and not just in the Premier League, but in, in, in the championship and all the other divisions below, the debt is unbelievable. And before COVID, the German Bundesliga, which insists, you know, in terms of television, consists basically of two divisions. The top division is the, is the Bundesliga, and then they have Bundesliga 2. So those two divisions comprise 18 clubs together. Before COVID, out of the 36 clubs in the Bundesliga 1 and 2, only three were in debt and they were in debt at the margin. They had no real debt to speak of. You had basically 33 clubs 
that were operating at a profit in the black. And they generated about four billion in revenue in euros. So I, for, for my purposes as an investor, obviously, you know, this is, you know, you've got to play the game here, right? When you join the Bundesliga, you're basically giving the control to the fans. Doesn't mean you can't generate revenue, generate a decent amount of revenue. The Bundesliga has the highest attendance for this sport on the planet, ahead of the English Premier League. They just don't generate as much money. Yeah, but so, so what I'm saying is the United States is positioned to turn this game on its head and at least create a bipolar football model whereby the United States and Brazil primarily, but basically North America and South America, would become a new UEFA. The money generating potential for North and South America would be enough to counterbalance the hegemony that Europe now controls. That's all. That's my case. And that's that's what the book was about. And that's what my project for football in the United States is about. It's about upsetting that balance and creating, you know, so a I'm happy to hear. World. I'm, I'm happy to hear what others think. My initial thoughts off the top are one. The U.S making the argument that the U.S. adopt a Bundesliga model is an exact way not to have anyone in this country want to engage because I feel like the people in this country, particularly those who rule it, would rather make less money that they control than make more money that they would have to share with anybody else. Uh, and that's why, to your point in, of your book, they would prefer to suppress even the financial potential of a, of a new sport for control of, over the NFL and the revenue it generates. And then my second point is thought is that, that is it true that a North and South American North central and South American Alliance could rival given the lack of interest among U S consumers and a lack of money among central and South American consumers. But that's just those are my my yeah. initial reactions. Uh, so I mean, obviously, I've got a I've got a retort, but I'd like to hear from you know from Daniel sure. and Matanda. Go for it, Matanda. Hmm? No, you go. I have, I have a do. I have a go ahead. I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I can contribute anything substantial. Um, well, I, yeah, I would say that whether I would want an American, whether that be North American or South American version of UEFA, I don't know if that's something that should be desired or longed for in some sense. I mean, if we look at what UEFA is right now, <laughs> I mean, I can't, I, can I call them corrupt and be okay? I guess so. But like <clears throat> the, 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 the idea of making one of those in an American face, um, that's not something I'm necessarily interested in. Um, to that point, though, I think the response to the proposed European Super League has kind of entrenched UEFA's position in the sense that because fans had such an adverse reaction to it, the messaging was horrible and just everything that transpired subsequently has just made the idea, I feel like, untenable, even if I agree with it on its, you know, at a, at, 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 on a core level, I agree that it should be something that's done, but I, I accept that it's something that's probably not going to happen, at least not within the next five, ten years. Um, UEFA are now in a deeper position or in a better position to do whatever they they want to make money. I mean, uh, Mutanda mentioned the new model in the Champions League that's coming next year, the Swiss model, where they're opening more spots. There's a few legacy spots. There's going to be more games. I mean, people are complaining already that there's, you know, fixture congestion and the players are playing too many games and this and that. But UEFA have decided just to keep you guys on side, then that way you guys won't go anywhere. We'll add more games to the schedule. Um, so UEFA aren't some, I don't know, paragon of virtue that are just doing things from the goodness of their heart. And we love the game so much. And we want to keep European football or football as a whole. We want to keep it safe and sacred. No, they're, they're in this for, for money. Same with FIFA. I mean, I just mentioned the, the, there's the world cup. There's the club world cup. I mean, you mentioned Gianni Infantino. I wouldn't quote anything that man says. There's something that, I mean, he, he's like the, the, uh, 
today I feel like a woman, today I feel like a migrant. Today, like he had this whole speech about that. I was just like, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that speech but, was crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. So, no, no, so, no, but the but, most. Like, yeah, sorry, so go, go, just, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Just, 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 just to put a bow on it. I don't. No, no, and to Jared's point, I, I feel like we can add. I don't know if the culture of Germany and their sporting culture is something that can be copy and pasted or even created in any way in the United States. Like, I don't think American people, now maybe this can change over time. Everything can change over time. Time isn't like some, some like things can change all the time and things are changing all the time. So I'm not saying that this isn't something that couldn't happen in 20 years that, you know, America just becomes a football crazy nation. Um, but it, you're, you're never going to get that Bundesliga-like atmosphere in the United States. Maybe it's something you think is worth trying. You know, go for it. But I don't think it's something that's ever going to kick off. So I don't know if it's – I don't think America can be as if Europe. I don't think that's something that can happen Fo can you in, all, in football wise. Sorry. Can I'm you good. all please indulge me this 90 seconds just so everybody can get on the same page? Please. I'm European. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I am European, not just I feel European. I think for what we Europeans have been doing in the last 3,000 years around the world, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 years <laughs> before starting to give moral lessons to people. Today, I have uh, very strong feelings, I can tell you that. Today I feel uh, Qatari. <laughs> Today I feel Arab. <laughs> Today I feel African. Today I feel uh, gay. <laughs> Today I feel Disabled. Today, I feel uh, a migrant worker. How long do you think he practiced that? Do me a favor, man, and, and put that put that link in the in the chat, Jared. But it, let, let, me, let, let me uh, let me tell you. Uh, let me it, just as a, in terms of a um, a response, in some sense, to to Daniel's comments and yours and Wakanda's as well. Oh, no, I didn't um, make my comments yet. You don't know what my comments are going to be. <laughs> oh, okay, so go go ahead. Go for it. Go for it. No, so maybe, I, I, maybe I'm a little bit more cynical with this, but I also think it's in line with I, – I can't get – I can't, you know, untangle football from – and the way that the, the game operates on a global level from so many things that I hear and follow, like on, on Black Power Media, for example, when it comes to revolutionary politics and, you know, the, the uh, taking going from theory to actual, like, people's lived experiences on the street. By that meaning, we can't divorce the big hitters in the world game from how this game operates on a communal level and the fact that this is where all over the world, people are really struggling to make ends meet, especially just when you look into this country, we started this show by talking about how all this money being poured into MLS because of Messi and this, how it's not materially changing. And I know, cause I've worked with these kids, right? It's not really changing the, the experience of the kids who don't have access to the game as it is right now. And so now it's just stratifying things even more, right? And so now as it relates to when we talk about these big leagues and UEFA's dominance and all that, to Daniel's point about UEFA not being, not doing this because of their, you know, a, a virtuous, like, we want to grow the game. I also think that the connection between UEFA and the dominant power structures running games here is maybe stronger than we think. So who's to say? And again, not to get, maybe this is just me being cynical, but I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest based on 
also how tournaments are run and operated and the money, right? And and these people all get together and talk and sit down with each other and like they they communicate, right? So who's to say that the the power players running the game here and the big money here aren't also working in accordance with UEFA to keep the game to keep uh, Europe as the stronghold of the game. Again, yeah, we, and, and, and I think that you've made that point as well, Robert. Like, I, I don't think Don Garber, for example, just to put a name on it as well, I don't think he would really – yes, I think he wants MLS to be a big league and all that, but I also don't necessarily believe whether he thinks or believes or is trying to take the center of the game from where it is now because big business is going to win – regardless and i just think it's all these people sort of hedging their bets and trying to control their own little kingdoms or fiefdoms and not giving a damn about who they run over to do it so that's that's only that's the only thing i would add but i i yeah robert what do you what do you got I'm, I'm, as you know i'm totally in agreement with what you just said i mean my my spiel on don garber is that he's doing exactly what he's there to do which is to make sure that this sport does not explode in the United States. So Don Garber and MLS, in effect, to use a metaphor, are the top on the pressure cooker for the sport in the United States. They're the lid on the pressure cooker. And they're the lid to make sure that this sport does not explode in the United States. I think that's their whole purpose. And to go back to to the issue of whether or not the United States has the culture to become, let's say, instead of the nation that they are, whether we could create a football culture in the United States, because as far as I'm concerned, there is no football culture in the United States. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to I'm going to backtrack. Almost 35 years to the 1990 World Cup. And the 1990 World Cup in Italy, uh, which was one of the most boring World Cups I ever saw, um, despite the fact that Maradona got to the final, but it was not what you call a pretty World Cup. And the, the interesting story that came out of that World Cup was told to me by a friend who, at the time, was living in Japan. And he told me the following story. He said that... Um, it was in the newspapers in Japan that a number of top Japanese business executives went to the World Cup in 1990 in Italy. Sony, Mitsubishi, I can't remember the, all, the, all the companies that went. But there was like a good, you know, good dozen of them that decided to go together. They came back from that World Cup and they were totally blown away with the World Cup as an event. And they wrote a letter to João Avalanche the Brazilian who was then the head of FIFA, and said, what do we need to do to bring the World Cup to Asia? And Avalanche wrote back and said, we can't give the World Cup to a country that doesn't have a professional league. So you have to create a professional league. Now, this is like 1990, like the fall of 1990. And they went about, in typical Japanese fashion, of getting organized to create a league in Japan. And they found out that there was already an informal workers league of employees from the various factories in some of the major metropolitan areas around Japan, Yokohama, Tokyo, etc. They had these kegs, they would bring out a keg on Friday afternoon and they would play football after work in these, you know, run down open lots that they could find. So they had the fledgling, you know, idea of some kind of competition between the corporations already. And somebody at Sony called up the art department at Sony and said, look, I want you to do the following. I want you to create on paper a league, 10 teams scattered around the country where we have these biggest corporations that can be corporate sponsors. So somebody in the art department at Sony 
created literally from scratch. They invented 10 team names. They invented the logos and designed the logos. They designed the uniforms, socks, jerseys, the whole nine yards for these 10 teams that did literally did not exist. And then Sony agreed to go to, I think it was Mizuna, one of the Japanese apparel companies for sports. And they literally pushed out this image of something called the Japan League or the J League, a professional soccer league. This is in 1991, except that the league didn't exist. What they did was they sold the image of the league for two years. They sold jerseys, socks, cups with logos on them, all the kind of merchandise stuff that you normally see today for sports leagues, except that the league didn't exist. And they sold this stuff exclusively in Sony's retail store network throughout Japan for two years. And they made $200 million in revenue over that 24-month period. $200 million. And this was before the internet. So this friend of mine is telling me this story. And he said, Ed, you know, as you probably know, the J-League got started in 1993, two years later, that's when they that's when they launched it. They had no teams, they had no players, they had no playing fields. So over this period of time, they they found that infrastructure and created it. That's how they launched the J League in in Japan. My argument is that we can take that model and do something that's never been done before in the United States. Now that we have proof that Uber can literally via an app, generate multiples of billions of dollars a year globally. And that you can do the same thing with an app for Airbnb. Why couldn't we do this for this sport? And the question is, well, how do you do that? How do you, how can you possibly break the log jam? And my argument about breaking the log jam is it has to do with branding. That part of the challenge in the United States and one of the beauties of the United States is that there are undiscovered brands that have not seen the light of day that are based on the deep demographic variety of the United States. And that today, if you look at the sports that are quote unquote fledgling sports like the WNBA um, or even the MLS, what has been one of the failures of these leagues? One of the failures is that they've all copied the same marketing and branding model of the big four sports. So all the brands that they have have basically glommed off of the big four sports branding model, which has already saturated the marketplace for brands, right? So you're basically copying a branding model that already exists in the United States and trying to grab market share. And there's just no market share to grab. So, so that's part of the argument. And this, all of this is in, the but book. but I think yeah I know, but that's what I think is is and maybe we have to save this for for the next round. But but I, I I'm I find I think I'm confused because part of your argument is on the one hand the political will among the ruling elites is not behind the development of another league that they don't have full control over or won't make as much money off of or that will maybe threaten an existing league. You don't need and, it. But that, but what you're what you're suggesting requires a political shift. No, it, it doesn't. doesn't require a political shift. What it requires is technology, and what it requires is targeted technology to a market that's being ignored. Can but I, nobody. Can, can, yes. Can, go can ahead, I, Dave. Yes. So, in in the Japanese example, the reason that the Japanese league, according to the the story you told, was somebody went to Sony. And they use Sony's distribution and marketing network over the course of years to promote leagues and team or teams that didn't yet exist, but were in the formation or in, you know, right. in, 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 in stages of being created. What would be, so what is the, if, if, if you want to pop this off in America, what is the version of Sony and Sony unique to Japan? I think has it like 
an outsized influence on what it's able to do within the Japanese population in terms of promoting and marketing. Even in globally, Sony is you know crazy. But what is the American version of that? And Shop Shopify. You have you have platforms in the United States, Amazon amongst them, where you can sell merchandise online to equate what happened in Japan 30 years ago. No, no, no. You like, you okay, no, like, you, I, brands, I, I, you have brands being created. I understand created in that, like, States Amazon has like time. a huge marketing platform that can get to everybody, but that's different than Amazon itself doing the, like, like you said, somebody at Sony created the logos, created the teams, this is true. had the shirts. Like, that's, that's different than me, some seller going on Amazon and trying to pop off 10 different teams. Like, that's not going to, that's not going to land in the same way of Sony actually doing it. Because, so, Robert, it would require Amazon to engage politically in allowing for equal distribution of a product just or, or a, a brand just as an example, which they don't hmm. do. We already know Amazon happily allows everybody to use this platform, but will easily promote those they prefer and, and marginalize. So it would, would take a – that's why I was – that's why I'm conf confused by the argument. You're saying we need, we need branding and technology, but branding and technology only work – when in the hands of those who already have political power, so we I'll, would have that's, to. That's 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 all. That's that's my. You just really a, think that's just, true? Just 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 just, just quickly tag on. Mm. Is is something controlled by Amazon something we should want, or if 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 Amazon is necessary in the American context to do something like Sony did in Japan, is that something we should be striving to do? Well, first of all, I'm I'm not saying that Amazon is necessary. I hear you. Okay. That's just your well, that, example. I'm not, of what I'm not, I'm not saying you. Amazon's necessary. I'm saying that there are, quote unquote, peer to peer platforms in the commercial world in the United States that are independent of Amazon and technically are structured for entrepreneurs. And that, in, in a sense, because social media is so deeply penetrated into the United States' social network and body, that if you can successfully place a marketing campaign online that targets a particular demographic, and you have to target your demographic in various demographic schemes across the United States, but if you do that, and you can create a quote-unquote prototype that's driven by this new model, I think you've got the potential to change the scheme of things with the sport in the United States. Now, again, that, you know, bringing in this whole thing of the Flamingo club model, you know, the, which does not exist in the United States, right? Bringing in the Bundesliga concept, which doesn't exist in the United States. So all those are issues, obviously. But what I'm saying is that and I the think NFL is an issue. issue. We'd have to get rid of, we'd have to get rid of their power hold as, but, as know, I'm reading the, in your book. The solution to the NFL is very simple. It's black women. <laughs> when black women, uh, I met you made this case, right? Basically, when black when women. black women and Latino and Latino women realize so giving their sons over, realize that there's an alternative for their sons to literally have a livelihood playing a sport that they love. That's an alternative to the NFL. The NFL will do what it's what it is destined to do. Decline. Black women, you heard it. Black women and Latin, and Latin black and brown women will be the you heard it here first. The, will be the death knell for the NFL. Hey, as we, we I, I assume, Jared, we're getting ready to wrap up. In the, yeah. but, but but I think I mean, this last point. Yeah. But yeah, this that last point's interesting though too because I think this is where it, we also can't ignore how history, tradition moves people right so even when you when you talk about black women and this is where again it comes back to the question of political power and, and, and not just will but but power and organization and movement because now specifically on that black women point with nfl let's not let's not lie about it there are many black women who love the nfl or who want their sons to be a part of that and then we the think NFL, it's the only way and the NFL's not stupid because how many 
the NFL, MLS, these organizations are increasingly trying to put black women and, 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 uh, you know, others as part of their tapestry uh, and presentation to make it seem like they're moving the needle forward. Right. I just, I think one thing is fascinating and I hope this is not too much of a tangent, but it's super interesting when you tune into any broadcast of sports and it's actually, it's happening in football as well. Just when you look at the panel, I always find it very fascinating to look at the panel of the, 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 the pundits, the commentators yeah. that they have associated with any sport, you know, and it's very predictable, right? And it's very, very interesting, right? Because you have some sort of combination of attractive female host, right? X player, and then like, and, and then pretty much that's it, right? A coach, it, don't forget, there's always a coach. Coach, maybe, yeah, former coach. And it's, and it's a very, very interesting, and increasingly what they're doing, right? And this, they're not slick except they are slick but they're also right is that when you you know diversify the people who do that and make those people more representative of the laborers that are playing the sport go back to this idea of of the viewing public and and we we think or a lot of people think that ah yeah see it's getting better right because you know you know, Malika Andrews and Jalen Rose are doing this broadcast. And so things are better now. You know what I mean? Like this is an actual thing. So we have, so in addition to everything that you've laid out, Robert, like we really have to fight against that too, right? We have to fight mm -hmm. against that, you know? And how it relates to football, how it relates to football is no matter what we, not no matter, again, I don't want to be too cynical about it, but let's be real. Sometimes what we're, what we have to battle too is the kids in Brazil and the kids in the U.S. who are growing up playing this sport. Part of the reason they want to go to Europe is because of the lure and the myth and the the, the 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 history of these very ancient competitions, right? Mm -hmm. So this is why an Endrick, for example, or whoever who grows up in a hotbed of football, right? Brazil is a hotbed of football. But what what does he say? What is his dream? Oh, I want to play for Real Madrid. And this is what their the tournaments that they enter in here and all these things they with their messaging with the commercials. They, they're always hitting this, right? The history, the legacy of the crest, you know? So it's it's all of the above. And it's a, yeah, it's a lot. It's a so, lot. but this goes back to the debate we had last time, GM. No, there, the, the amount of kids that would be 6'5", 300 pounds, who you say wouldn't be able to play soccer, wouldn't exist. Most of those kids become 6'5", 300 out of a desire to get on a football field. Uh, um, one of the one of the keys, and I should go find him again. And and but there was a um, it, it was actually a white offensive lineman who I saw a video of that that actually as as much as anything else inspired me to adjust how I was approaching weight loss some years ago. And it was this offensive lineman who played in the NFL at, at 330, 340 pounds. And then you see him in this video, and he's like one ninety. And Did his whole point the Vikings. Matt, I can't remember. Matt Burke, I think Matt Burke. that might have been him. Yeah. yeah. And but his whole point was as soon as you stop eating and living to be and lifting weights to be 350, 340, and you get an appropriate diet and then appropriately exercise, you don't nobody's not nobody. Very few people are naturally going to stay and live at that size without a desire to, to be at that level to play a, to play a game. So what, what I was thinking was we'd have more Paul Pogba's, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, whatever, 200, whatever he is, svelte, thin, playing the game. Uh, th that's my point. So the whole if political the economy of, would change. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah, if you ahead. hear the stories of like what college teams make offensive linemen do to get bigger, it's crazy. Like they're like you have to eat this whole pizza and then go to sleep for just it's just no. A they told wild... the no, the one not, training camp not, I made not even it to talking about the steroids. Or oh no, we're not even getting to the steroids. <laughs> we're not even getting to the steroids because because we already know I that that I've, I've that, seen that shit. Up no, close. <laughs> no, yeah, me too. No, nobody's very few people are gonna. Yeah, you get rid of the steroids, and what we would have then is what what, what does exist. Even I'm sure at even pro uh, soccer, pro world football is uh, some form of human growth hormone, some sort of some sort of uh, something that allows people to recover faster. But this this bulk thing would go away. But but uh, um, 
Dang, I just lost the point I was going to make. But there was – no, I saw it at the training camp I went to for little Frostburg State football. They were, they were, they were, uh, for, I remember I got yelled at during one sprint drill because they were saying, they were saying, you, you want to be a defensive lineman, but you run and you eat like an offensive lineman. And they were saying, if you don't want to be, <laughs> if <laughs> they were like, you want to sack quarterbacks, you got to adjust your diet or we're going to put you, or keep eating the way you want to, or we'll put you on the offensive line. So and there was this encouragement. And then, and then specifically to Daniel's point, they would say, you're you you're our, supposed to be our offensive tackle. You're not big enough. Eat and get in the gym. And then there's also then you know the wink wink nod nod and whatever else you think you might need to do if you want to make it to D one or D two or or wherever else. Mm. No, and I and I agree with what you say there, Jared. I I think that's spot on. Like the the our bodies, people's bodies would change if they had a different avenue, and then they train for that. But the what but what's what you didn't mention or the where people take the argument is, and this is I think what Daniel and I were saying in that if I go think way back is what they take the argument to, and it's really an American exceptionalist argument, right? Which is oh because we have these big bodies, we sh- we could via these big athletic bodies we should be running world football if only we got these big bodies to be good at this sport. And where Daniel and I were trying to come in is no. You need to you need to step back. That's a that's putting the cart before the horse because what what you're ignoring is what's re, that this is an early specialization sport, and that what's required is for kids to attain a certain level of connection from their brain to their feet, which happens when you're really young, right? And then from there they grow and their bodies become attuned to behaving in this way. And then they reach a, a, a top level. And then mm-hmm. this is why when you just look at world football, this is why you see so few Paul Pogba's, right? They didn't make that many of them. Or to be honest, Yaya Toure. Y'all remember Yaya Toure? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Special, special, amazing. But here's the thing is, he's that's 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 unique. Like there are not many of those. And, and, yeah. and <clears throat> the reason there are not many of those isn't because in these uh, uh, top footballing nations, because they 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 – because they don't have big people who look, who are the size of Yaya Toure. It's because they understand that just because you're a big person like Yaya Toure, if you haven't had the level of footballing education that Yaya Toure had since he was a kid, you're not going to be that good for the sport. So that's the, that's also, also that, and just to tag, tag along <laughs> for, uh, American football, American basketball, or not American basketball, just basketball in general, like sports that Americans are generally that they play baseball, they're predicated on, you know, power, speed, jumping ability, just like raw athleticism. Um, Football is not necessarily a raw athletic sport in the sense of, you know, if you're very fast, it's a benefit, but, you know, that can only get you but so far because you have to be able to control the football technically. Tyreek Hill, he can catch a football and run faster than anybody, but he's not having to do anything with the ball except catch it. Now, catching it is his own skill, and he's very talented, and it's a it's a crazy thing. But you put a football at his feet, and it would look different. So he, he's he not would running need, that fast. Yeah. He, he 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 would need what Mutanda said, which was like the the skill from a from a child to build that up. So I think with, because American sports are primarily about speed, jumping, power, how strong you are, how fast you are. Even like the whole what the NFL combine, they bench how much can you bench press? How fast can you run a 40? And those are the measurements that can get people drafted and make so much money. They that the the, the American aesthetic of, of what they believe sports is then translates to what they feel like will work well in football, and those things don't necessarily o- overlap. You're right. And we should have known the British take credit for for inventing the game. We know damn well they're not gonna be the most fast and strong and <laughs> But, but, yeah, yeah and, and but candidly, this is an playing. insight. This playing, is an insight yeah. into how the sport looks. Here. You ain't playing. You ain't playing. <laughs> this, Don't tell me you, you play because you ain't playing. Yeah, you're not. You know, you ain't playing. You ain't playing. No, if, if y'all think about it this way too, like I'm, I make the point about um, like the school system. We can't. What's really fascinating is when you look to see in the city of Seattle, right, where I where, where I do my my program. When you see the schools in the inner city, right, and you see the level of access a lot of those kids have, predominantly low-income, 
black, brown kids and the access that they have to the sport and you see their level. Then you drive just a little bit in the city and you go to a different locale and you go to a, it doesn't even have to be a private school, but let's say it's a public school in a more affluent area. And then you see the same age group of kids and the access that they have to the game because it's expensive and the clubs that they have access, right? The resources that they have. And you see their skill level, it's night and day. Similar age kids, one group of kids who maybe come from a, 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 a place in the world, they're immigrants and maybe come from a place in the world where they love the game, but because they, they haven't had this, they're, they're, they're really not very good. They're really not. And I see it all the time. And this is the, uh, it, it's really fascinating. You know, it's really fascinating. So to, I would make the argument that, again, when, I, when we go back to what the powers that be, the changes that they can make to make this sport really something, they know what it is. Right. Because they know that it's early specialization and they know that the kids, the the population of people who love, love, love the sport have kids who are priced out of it. What that would mean is they would have to go into public schools and 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 improve the quality of resources that those kids have. But they don't do that with education. So why the hell would they do that with football? (laughs) Right. Good point. You know what I mean? They don't. So, hence my point about football. Just, just one additional avenue we can take that leads to the conclusion that we need more political organization and revolutionary change in political power. Yep. It's just one more lane we're taking here. That's all. Yeah. Uh, Fellas, anything else you want to get to today? I'm not rushing us. I just noticed we're over two hours, so I, I am trying to be mindful of everybody's I, I, time I, I and would, energy. I want, but, to, but. I want to build on what you just got through saying, Jared, which is this whole thing of organization and uh, you know building a foundation. I, I think two points are, are important. One is we haven't talked about a women, and I think that that's a the elephant in the room is women. We have. Uh, we but, said black and brown women. Well, no, no, the I'm future talk, of the I'm, revolution. I'm, you just. Oh, I understand. Okay. I understand. I, 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 no, I okay. totally agree with you on that. I'm, I'm just. I'm, just I'm, I'm talking about. I'm talking about women playing the game, because this is a game that, at least in terms of its potential, um, for for a woman's sport in the United States, it has it has substantial potential. And I think that women. Quite frankly, no, no, no reason to cast aspersions on, on us, as as men. But um, I think the future of the game in the United States, in particular, um, is quite frankly in the hands of the women. I think that the women will make or break this sport in the United States. Um, and I think that the the whole club concept that I'm imagining. Um, is exactly in theory the mechanism for grassroots organizations that you're talking about. You know, so that's that's how I'm looking at the sport as a as a tool to raise consciousness and um, do the best we can do in the context of capitalism that has gone crazy. Does BAP have an athletic association, or does a, the All African People's that, Revolutionary Party do they have like a sporting division? Not that I'm aware of. I think that is an incredibly good question. And so many members of both of those organizations are are, are present. We should maybe, absolutely maybe, put that on the table. Maybe which Yellow, which organizations are these? Say those Yellow organizations. They're, no, they're just revolutionary, African revolutionary organizations. So, so all African People's Revolutionary Party, of which I am a, 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 both of them, I'm small insufficiently involved members of the all african people's revolutionary party co-founded by seku Ture, kwame nkrumah and and carried on by kwame Ture. uh so there's the one connection then black alliance for peace oh, is yeah. another uh um big organization doing big things around all well, the world uh, and they have a they have a, a very internationalist approach and and have been active in our chat always are so I, I think that that to whatever extent they don't or we don't address ourselves in in, in a particular way to, to to sport I think would be that's a fascinating 
Wait, there was a Socialist Olympics? I don't know anything about that. Uh, 1980? But no. You, or, they don't mean, yeah, right, right, right. The, <laughs> the, the one, the U.S. boycott. <laughs> but yeah, I think, look, to the extent all of these can be over, there can be an overlap in all of this would be great. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point, even, even said partially in jest. But fellas, yeah. look. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Mutana, go ahead. No, no, no. I was, I, I was, yeah, it's, uh, no, I, I had nothing. I was, I was just laughing because I, I mentioned Diallo's name in there. I don't know if you caught that because I was, just oh, no, I, I'll buy for, yeah, right. I, right. I, I, I said it because this whole idea, Ball of, chasers, yeah, yeah. yeah where, where, no, I, I never, I'm not making fun. I'm respect, I, it's a question I'm constantly interrogating, right? And it, it just for myself because I do this as a profession. And, and so I'm just thinking about when it comes to, Robert, I love the term you use, you know, conscious raising. You know, what's the role of a, of, a, of, of these sports in our collective liberation? You know, I don't know. That's now, a, remember the concession we sort of forced out of Diallo, as I remember it. He, he would, I don't think, agree with my memory. But, but my memory is that <laughs> Geechee and I forced the concession that there's a difference between ball chasers who are just blindlessly and even working against us in their pursuit of a dollar and people who are athletes and even professionals. Uh, mm -hmm. So, 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 but, but. So the commodification of sport is his problem, not athletics themselves. It sounded like that, right? Because he had, because he has sons who. Per, yeah, per, and he's per, an athlete per, himself. He was talking athlete. about he likes bike riding and all that, you know. So it's not that he's opposed. It's, so I'm trying to, if I, I be fair to what I think is his argument and one that I I think is you know uh, uh, a, a little bit off in it in, in its emphasis. So the uh, next time you're with you him, know, next time you're with him, just maybe tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, yeah. So I would I would think of it. Maybe we think of it in terms of like a. The thing I think about is like how Capoeira started in Brazil, for example, right? Hmm. I was like, it's it's like a like a hmm. form of martial arts. Why to fight to get out of this thing? But oh, as soon as someone's coming, it's like okay, we're gonna dance a little bit. But it's and then there's this fusion of you know that it, it comes from a revolutionary place. So I don't know. It's a form of if we think of sport participation in sport as a way to prepare the body, the mind, the mind for achieving a better, you know, achieving a, a conscious raising or a better politics, then maybe it's useful, right? Because obviously, undoubtedly, even Diallo, right? Even Diallo, respect the brother Diallo, anybody would, would appreciate that you do learn a lot of life lessons from taking part in collective organization, which is what sports is. Can well, I, I think anything, so, I just would say, I think anything approached with a certain frame can become frame. revealing in terms right. of what's going on. Uh, yeah. And yes, yes, Rao, uh, Diallo's argument is whatever mine is. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. No, 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 no. I was just, I was just yeah. going to pitch that um, Africa is a country. One of my friends, Maher Mazahi, mm -hmm. he's doing or has done a series. Right, on... I thought he was supposed to be here. I thought that, isn't that why we scheduled around today? That reminded I me. Thought, yeah, I, I thought... thought that was, no, because I thought this was going to be about European Super League and then the next one was going to be about AFCON. So, like, I thought we, time... my bad, I forgot. I thought we initially picked this time to accommodate. No, 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 no. I, th I thought that was going to I... be the next one after. Yeah, this. I thought so too. Oh, my bad, yeah. my bad. Well, okay. Yeah. So, but, but, but no, he, he's, he's doing a series on um, African leaders who have used football to kind of generates or support their political ends on the African continent. So he's talked about there's one on mm. Kenneth Kayunda of Zambia, one on Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, uh, Nasser of Egypt. I mean, not that he agrees with the politics or anybody should, but uh, uh, Mobutu from Congo had used football in some ways. Gaddafi, even though he wasn't a fan of sport, it was in the Green Book and different things. So he, he's, well, we he's know laid Mobutu, it all out. So. Mobutu, Mobutu used boxing. Of course. So the, he had no problem with Don King. Rumble in the, the jungle the, and different the, the things. Rumble. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's um the, the African five-a-side part. So we'll have him on mm. hopefully, ho ho hopefully to talk about um AFCON soon. So Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. We, we already have a starter then for next time, it sounds like. Yeah. 
if, if, if the well, schedule you know, can align be, for sure. Before, for sure. We, before we close, I want to give a shout out as a as a fan of the beautiful game. I want to give a shout out, a shout out to the sisters who won the D1 championship in football from Florida State. FSU was full of sisters. As a matter yeah. of fact, they were playing against my alma mater, and it wasn't even a game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just not a game. They're at another level. They are literally at another level. So I want to give a shout out to the So because the, the there were two you sent. Wait, was this the one? The, there were two you sent for worthy of a shout yeah, that's, out. There they are. There they are. Yeah. So so right on. Shout out to them. Absolutely. And then you sent another one uh, uh, that I thought I just want to give a quick shout out to as well. Uh, acknowledgement of which I thought was was powerful. Uh, but this story about the German under oh, seventeen yeah. national team. Just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, that's um, predictable uh, though. So, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, I mean right, so well, I don't think it's predictable, but that the German team would be this black. It would be predictable it's that not, they would be this black think, and be really good. I didn't think so. I didn't yeah. think so. I was I'm, I'm still angry. shocked. I mean, that's, every that's Sunday, Ruger, like it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, you're France probably is, right. You're France right. is already, right. France is already lost. Jared, Jared, look, at England. England. look at England's team. Look at England. England and France for sure. It was, it, but you know, German. I, England, but Germans, you know, I got my, my my mind thinks of Germany has they got a special England, brand of whiteness. You know what I mean? England, they France, do, but you know when it Portugal, kicked off, Netherlands, you know, and, but Germany didn't call. Germany was kept from colonizing as much as though. That's that's what I'm saying. Like. England, France are definitely going to have a whole African world to draw from. Germany, yeah. less so. That's why I'm. And then they have a particular brand of whiteness they that do, I that I thought I might have, do. you know. I remember when it off. I forget the, I forget the brother's name. I forget the brother's name, but I think in the 2002 World Cup, Daniel, you might help me on this one because you, you're good with this thing. In Germany, 2002 World Cup, Germany had, I want to say, one brother. I think it was 2002, oh. 2006. It was what it was like one brother. He's like a striker. I forget his name. Uh, yes, I, I, I forget, forget his name. name. But anyway, but the point is, Germany. It was like nothing to your point, Jared, because it was like a special kind of you know they were not France. Then it was like okay, we got one, and then it, the 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 floodgates, and then basically all the whether it's it's a hey, people serving in the military, whatever you get like, you know. Uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you get African German mixtures, and so then you get yeah. The, now the Leroy Sanes are like par for the course, right? So there he is, Gerald Asamoah. That's Gerald right. Asamoah. Gerald Asamoah. Was it 2002 that he broke into the national team? That's when I go. That's what I googled, and and his <laughs> name came. I just googled Black German 2002, like, and yeah. it, and he came up. What was his position? So. Well, uh, Asamoah. So clearly he's Ghanaian. Pretty sure, yeah. So Please, then it, yeah. Yeah. Now, now Germany's now yeah. All these teams now it's like. The, the the holdouts though, Jared, and this is where it's funny. <laughs> the black savior. <laughs> it's oh really no, he, funny. he yeah, yeah, it's well, really well. funny to see like the the European nations that obviously that are like, okay, we we'll, we got a few of them, man. We're still winning, so okay, we this, a lot of people don't like it, but we're still gonna have them. And then you have those European nations that I'm gonna categorize in like the they're not even begrudging. They're just like, look, we're gonna try to stop this at all point. So like Italy is really fast. Italy. Because Italy, Italy, <laughs> had Italy, and he was he was so good they couldn't deny him. Right? They're like, okay, we really don't like. So you, they broke him down mentally. That's what I think they did. He's like, we don't like you, but you're the, you're you're gonna you're gonna start. You're gonna play. But as soon as obviously something's wrong with him or he needs a little help, oh, he yeah. starts making whatever mistakes. Then he's gone. But now you can see Italy. I mean. They're not, they haven't been in the last two World Cups. I mean, so. yeah. So Italy's always gonna have be like, nah, no, thank you. Uh, I, I can't imagine Russia's ever going to have anybody. And again, I'm not advocating for this to happen. I just think it's funny looking at the European teams that are like, yeah, brothers. I looked up, what is it, Dynamo Zagreb Z Z Z in Russia? Zagreb. No, yeah. Notoriously racist. Okay. No, I, it's, I, it's, it is, I thought it was Zenit. Z definitely, oh. definitely okay. Zenit St. Petersburg. Their supporter group put out something that was like, "We don't yeah. want you to sign we any black players." Yeah, and that's, that's when amazing. they had they had like a many Brazilians. Hulk, yeah, they had the Hulk. Malcolm, they had Hulk over there. Several. It's but amazing. Um, there are yeah, some nations you know that, and and good and good, right? Like look, Portugal look, is the main. Like Portugal and France are the no main two that no. like accept Africans. Leal. for for oh, it, it goes okay. back to. Eusebio, who Eusebio. was born in Mozambique. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Eusebio was a bad man. 
the yeah, Black yeah. Pearl they called him, I think. But but yeah. Uh, oh no, Black they, Panther. He was Black Panther, wasn't he? They did call him that because I had I had a magazine article from when I was a kid that talked about Eusebio as a Black Panther, as the mm. Black Panther. I remember that actually. Uh, Even what's his face? Twenty sixteen. Which is still a step won, up from Wakanda. They, if, if if you look at the the twenty sixteen <laughs> UEFA you, you, the 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 Euro final in twenty sixteen France against Portugal, count the Africans. And I think they outnumbered the Europeans in that 2016 final. And then the Definitely winner was France. And, and 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 then the winner was scored by Adair um mm-hmm. in injury time, who was that, that was the final that Cristiano Ronaldo didn't play in, isn't that right? Or yeah, he got know. injured and the bug injured. Was, yeah. Yeah. And the, and the brothers took but Europe's, over. Europe's <laughs> having Europe's having uh, Europe is having their own reckoning with all this, right? And predictably, the the it's not even the far right. I think even quote unquote liberals are like a little uncomfortable sometimes, right? It's it's like okay, now we've, oh, definitely. we've we've given him we've given him the keys to the national team. What's next? Now they're gonna be one, you know what I mean? It's like it, so uh, a really interesting document. This is an old video, but I don't know if you guys have seen. It's called uh, Bleu Blanc Beu or something, or like the Chinese. There's it's black a, it's black a, blanc beau. Black it's, blanc beau. It's a it's a documentary on the French national team. Really? And, yeah. It's a documentary on the French national team and and basically how is it from ninety eight, Daniel? Or is it is it it's about the ninety eight team? It goes from ninety four, ninety six when they missed the World Cup and so then they the got then they transitioned into ninety eight yeah. when they won the World Cup up into twenty ten when you know yeah. the team took Dominic hostage and yeah. But know, it, but it's basically it's basically it's basically no different than like a a documentary that you make here and that you've seen here. That like a Zy- that Zyron's made, for example, on like how perceptions of you know the laborers in the NFL fall along predictable political lines, right? And how these you know things like that. And basically, the French team uh, when they win, yeah, it's celebrated, but obviously, with wait, no that- way, this is true. The yeah, yeah, he got his yeah. first black ref yesterday. Officially, yeah. not yesterday. not not the first, not so the, the first, first, but it's yeah, but like the first in a long time. That's ridiculous. And it was like the worst game he could have. Re- it was like Sheffield against some Burnley, <laughs> or like they gave him like the worst <laughs> game they could have given him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, like, man. Man. It, 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 it was literally, literally the worst Liverpool. game they could have given him, but. They're not gonna give him Arsenal versus Liverpool, but Mm-mm. yeah, uh, that's for <laughs> Michael Oliver and those guys. But yeah, oh man! All right, so all right, so more on on the African world. We're gonna all we have to do is is work out the schedule around whatever everybody can make it. We don't have to have a set time. So um, whenever I'd, whenever I'd prefer uh, something uh, early early January if we could. But all right. So, and I'm, but but even in terms of time of the day, whenever you know, like the uh, uh, um, whenever the brother is able to, we can we can work that out. Who was the first? Uh, I think his name was Uriah. U- what are we Uriah? talking about? Refs. The first first black referee. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's Uriah. You Uri- something. <laughs> Somebody will Google listen, it. Listen, before listen. before we go, Daniel, what what part of North Carolina are you in? What city are you in? Greensboro. Greensboro. Jared, 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 are you in Baltimore? I'm technically in Howard County, Columbia, Maryland, which is, is okay. a suburb in between okay. D.C. and Baltimore. Okay. And this Lutana, is we know, is in Seattle. Hey, careful, man. We don't want to. We don't need to be outing everybody. <laughs> they might be <laughs> everybody knows the location. Where, 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 yeah, okay. where are you in Brazil, I mean, Robert? J- just, where just, just, just to include the uh, the paranoia. I mean, you, you guys are you in know, Rio, Robert? I'm in Rio. Okay. You guys, you guys know that the uh, all of our sessions um, now that they're online and being taped, there's a dedicated um, analyst at the CIA tracking everything we're doing. Oh, so wow. just just to let you know that, you know. or maybe a CNSA, I'm, I don't know which one. It is. I would be disappointed if there wasn't. Exactly. I, I, you know, so peace to them as well. You know, it's it's always good to be surveilled by the best, to the best. And that's uh, right. I mean, you know, whatever. I mean. I'm with the Ruba. Everything but tactics and strategy should be out on the open anyway. So I mean, what else is there? To, like, what else? What else is there? Uh, Except for the tactics that that Matanda was breaking down earlier. Those tactics are are, are open for discussion. 
uh, uh, that was that was dope. Yeah. So, all right, fellas, look, it's always a pleasure. I, I love these conversations. This has been great. And uh, uh, to all the, those in the BPM audience who I know wait with bated breath for the next discussion of, of, of soccer, you're welcome. You're all welcome. And uh, and any any other the, the links to everybody's uh, work and relevant uh, socials and everything is in the show description. Uh, anything you want to leave us with? Any announcements? Anything uh, other? Other than I'm, I'm working on an article. So first of all, before and I hope everybody gets a chance to kind of close up. But thank you all so much. Um, this is amazing. This is therapy. I appreciate this. Uh, appreciate you all. Uh, I, not as a shot. Like some of the things I was referencing today are, are things that and I had a really great discussion with my brother in law the other day about some of these things, because I, I my fascination is in the, in which my fascination is um is in the way in which we conceptualize space. Um, and I think that's, again, where I, I want to be clear because I respect to people watching the game and what, listening to this or think that, like, you may think, oh, they're just uh, fascinated with, you know, the European game or, or a certain coach or a certain way of playing. No, I, I'm a lover of football. But more than that, I'm a lover of how people uh, organize to achieve an objective collectively. Uh, and I think that's beautiful. And so there are different ways. Art can come in different forms. Um, but I do think the way in which we conceptualize space is important. Um, and it relates to a lot of things going on in the world, right? So when you, you obviously you guys touched upon uh, 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 the genocide happening in Gaza and all that. I mean, that that falls directly from the ways in which people think they have ownership to space, right? And certain calling and the way they need to eliminate certain peoples in order to then access that space. And so from that standpoint, um, look out for a, a piece that I'll be coming out with. I'm, I'm trying to write something that relates to that, that tries to connect that to football uh, as well. Um, so it's just this big project. Usually just like a good British game would, they tell you to take your space when you have it. Yeah. They, yeah. They, 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 there's imperialism baked in the game. No, I'm just I look forward to that. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, I just and then Robert, appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and, and Robert, uh, um, uh, the only other thing that I, that we talked about before you got here with with Daniel was that we have to adjust the time of the next show to count for the fact that we will all be live in Rio. So, <laughs> I, when, when, so when, we, when are you coming down? Uh, we, I mean, we, we, that's part of what we have to work out. But that, okay. that I understood was to be the plan that the it, the next next edition of. of I would suggest I would suggest just just to lay the cards on the table that you <laughs> that you not come for carnival because it's too crazy. Come I've on, never man. heard that. Yeah, Rob, yeah. that's that's a setup, my man. That, that, you, you can't. That's the exact carnival. opposite I mean, of everything I've ever heard. <laughs> Well, I mean, you're the you first one to say you, don't come during carnival. <laughs> all, all, aren't you guys all married? Or maybe Daniel's not married. Dan, are you married? Happily. No. no, no. Oh, Daniel's not. Daniel's not I'm married. happily married. I'm okay. happily married. So, I, mean, so I would married, have to get permission. If you're married, I was going to say, if, if your wife gives you permission, that is like, that's amazing. Then you got an amazing marriage. I mean, maybe she'd be down there with me. She did we get super yeah. chats that you need to read, by the well, way? That's we did. Funny. You know what we did, Daniel? Thank you for that. We did. And my bad. I'm not being a good host today. Uh, uh, so, yeah, this is not a super chat, but I did star this because uh, Mukum Tagara is correct. Capitalism yeah, keeps capitalizing. Carnival, so, yeah. uh, <laughs> ZZ Lion, thank you very much. Style of play as coach, uh, as coach of b-ball in American football. All we talking about is man marking zone, zonal marking versus hybrid matchup zone. And then ZZ's back again. Thank you very much. Best skill in most athletic teams play man. The lesser skills would play a combination of hybrid and zone then create counterattack by nutrition. Uh, Syracuse. They will have, <laughs> have less counterattacks for exciting plays. Uh, Wait, counterattack by nutrition. Is that a typo? Is that, is that, I don't understand that. And, yeah, I'm but, not sure what that means either. But thank you again. Uh, uh, Sony model will not work. Resources, fields, the production. Oh, the Sony model. Okay. The production of high school sports on uh, own the players in the fields. Players must go to school or else their parents will go to jail. Damn. Hmm. Uh, ZZ again. The only two sports are promoted in high school in the inner city is football and basketball. The coaches are babysitter for two to three hours. 
I think and that's one more from sure. ZZ. Girl high school flag football is taking over girl sports in high school football. I don't see it where my daughters are, but that would be dope. I'm, I wish they would have had an organized flag football for boys when I was growing up. Uh, uh, I should try to find an old man league now. I, I'd love to play that. Uh, it might be the only thing I could do at this point. But, uh, yeah. But So thank you all for those super chats, ZZ in particular. And, uh, uh, yeah. Daniel, anything you want to leave us with real quick? No. Just, no? Yo, okay. If – if you can go to the continent and you haven't been, you should go. So that's to my. Go to the that's continent. My that's yeah, right you, you have to share screen. some pictures with us, Daniel. I did. It's in. It's on your phone. It's on your phone. Really? Yeah, I'm. A, I'm gonna have to link with you offline, Daniel. Yeah. To talk about check that, that off. Yeah. Well, we gotta, when yeah. when 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 we talk about Afcon on the next one, I'll I'll, I'll go deeper into the adventure because it might be more relevant in that yeah. in that in that. Sure. Sense, but nah, sure. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it right on. <laughs> yeah. All right, fellas. Thanks again. I look forward to catching right. you next have time. All right. Have a good one. Boas entradas, as they say. Boas entradas. Boas entradas. Have, have, have a good 2024. I feel like Fred Sanford. Bones and notches to you, too. <laughs> that was all right. Peace, fellas. Take it easy. Okay. Take care. Peace, Bye -bye. And thanks to all of you once again. Please do like, share, subscribe. Support the channel in any way you can, materially through Patreon or immaterially. Just like, share, subscribe, comment. Really appreciate those who are here live and the rest who will see this later. Peace to you as well. Uh, as always, only if you're willing to fight for it, like Fred Hampton used to say. So catch you next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the platform. Please make sure you got the bell rung so you don't miss anything. And like I said, we will catch you next time uh, here at I Mix What I Like and throughout. Peace. And what do you sacrifice? Calm. Kindness, kinship. Love. I've given up all chance at inner peace. I made my mind a sunless space. I share my dreams with ghosts. I wake up every day to an equation I wrote 15 years ago for which there's only one conclusion. I'm damned for what I do. My anger, my ego, my unwillingness to yield, my, my eagerness to fight. They set me on a path from which there's no escape. I yearn to be a savior against injustice without contemplating the cost. And by the time I look down, there's no longer any ground beneath my feet. What is my, what is my sacrifice? I'm condemned to use the tools of my enemy to defeat them. I burn my decency for someone else's future. I burn my life to make a sunrise that I know I'll never see. Now the ego that started this fight will never have a, a mirror or an audience or light of gratitude. But what do I sacrifice? Everything, 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 everything. everything. everything.